الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين سعادة الدكتور عبد الله العمير رئيس الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال سعادة الدكتور عبد العزيز بن عبد الله التويم نائب رئيس الجمعية رئيس المؤتمر رئيس اللجان المنظمة لفعاليات اليوم العالمي للسكري 2020 أصحاب السعادة المتحدثين في هذا المؤتمر السادة الأفاضل الحاضرون والمشاركون معنا في المؤتمر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نرحب بكم في المؤتمر العلمي لمستجدات مرض السكري والذي يعقد تزامنا مع المناسبة الصحية العالمية اليوم العالمي للسكري والذي صادف يوم أمس السبت الرابع عشر من شهر نوفمبر الحالي حيث عقد مؤتمرنا الأول في هذه المناسبة بعنوان المؤتمر السادس للمثقفين الصحيين لمرضى السكري وها نحن اليوم نعقد المؤتمر الثاني بعنوان المؤتمر العلمي لمستجدات مرض السكري تنظم المؤتمرين الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال بالتعاون مع ملتقى الخبرات لتنظيم المعارض والمؤتمرات وبدعم من شركة للي للأدوية وبرعاية إعلامية من إذاعة ألف ألف اف ام اتشرف بوجودي معكم انا الدكتور عبد الحفيظ خوجه استشاري طب المجتمع والاعلام الصحي وساكون معكم في تقديم واداره الحوار مع الاساتذه المتحدثين الكرام في هذا المؤتمر العلمي واتمنى لكم قضاء وقت سعيد ومفيد مع ما سيقدمه الاساتذه المتحدثون الافاضل For the non-Arabic speakers, dear attendees and participants in our conference, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We welcome you to the scientific conference on diabetes updates, which is held in conjunction with the global health event World Diabetes Day, which coincides with the day number 14 of November every year. Yesterday, the Saturday, the 14th of November, we held our first conference, the Six Health Educators Conference for Diabetes. And today, we are delighted to speak to you in our second conference, the Scientific Conference for Diabetes Updates. The two conferences are organized by the Saudi Pediatric Association in cooperation with the Forum of Experiences for Organizing Exhibitions and Conferences and with the support of Lilly Company for Drugs and the media sponsor from Alif Alif FM Radio. I am honored to be with you to present and manage the dialogue with the distinguished speakers and uh, in this scientific conference. I wish you to spend a valuable and useful time with what the distinguished professors and speakers will present. Now, we ask His Excellency Dr. Abdel Aziz bin Abdullah at Tiwim to give the word of Saudi Pediatric Association on behalf of the association president, His Excellency, Dr. Abdullah al Umair. Atfadl, Doctor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. I would like to welcome you all in this uh, uh, meeting, the uh, World Diabetes Day uh, webinar and on behalf of the Saudi Pediatric Association and on behalf of Dr. Abdullah Al-Umir, the president of the Saudi Pediatric Association, 
I would like to welcome you all to this uh, conference. Yesterday, it was an important uh, day for all the world. It was the 14th of November, 2020. On that day, there was a big event where the discovery of insulin was done in 1922 in Toronto, Canada. All the world is celebrating the World Diabetes Day and Saudi Pediatric Association has been doing this celebration for many years and uh, doing all the necessary conferences and increase the education of uh, uh, pediatricians, family medicine, nurses, uh, diabetic educators in the field of diabetes. Uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, just a little information about the Saudi Pediatric Association and uh, want also at the same time to thank uh, our uh, colleagues who make this uh, event uh, possible. I would like to uh, thank Murtaga Al Khabarat, the Maharad, and the Tanzim Al Mu'tamarat. I would like to thank Eli Lilly for supporting uh, this event. I'd like to thank also the Saudi uh, TV and Idaat Alif Alif FM. I would like to thank all the media correspondents who make this event possible. Yesterday, we have more than 1,300 uh, people attended our uh, webinar. And today we are expecting actually the same. Would like also to thank the speakers for this event and would like to thank our moderator, Dr. Abdul Hafid Khoja, who is always available and helpful to, uh, to be available in this uh, uh, event. The, uh, the Saudi Pediatric Association is the, the first association, sorry, just to, uh, the, the Saudi Pediatric Association is actually the first association uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, who actually started in 1981. And uh, this actually, uh, this, uh, let me just move this here. The Saudi Pediatric Association uh, is one of the, just, I think it's moving now. The Saudi Pediatric Association uh, established in 1981. And uh, since then we've been uh, involved in many uh, uh, conferences and many symposia and nowadays within the uh, era of Corona with many uh, webinars. The uh, Saudi Pediatric Association was established by uh, Al-Marhoum uh, Dr. Hassan bin Abdullah Kamal. He was actually the first president for the Saudi Pediatric Association and he was the dean of the college at uh, that time. Uh, the uh, uh, Saudi Pediatric Association board uh, members or board directors consist of nine uh, members, uh, namely uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Umair, the president, Dr. Muad al Tareki, Professor Muslim al Saadi, Dr. Khalid al Mubarik, Professor Asad Asiri, Professor Saad al Saadi, uh, Professor Abdurrahman al Sultan, and Dr. Ahmed Balkhair. They are from different hospitals and different agencies to run this, uh, uh, this association. We have been everywhere actually with uh, webinars and with uh, conferences and with uh, symposia. And we have been in uh, Riyadh, in Jeddah, in Mecca, in Taif, in um, uh, uh, Gunfida, uh, everywhere in the kingdom, uh, Saudi Pediatric Association was there. 
we conducted more than 100 uh, pediatric update symposia and uh, uh, conferences, and also conducted a lot of uh, courses. Most importantly is the diabetic, uh, the diabetic uh, educator uh, course, which is run in collaboration with National Guard uh, and also before that with King Saud, uh, uh, King Saud University. So uh, this is actually just a small, uh, a small uh, idea about the Saudi Pediatric Association and uh, would like actually to thank you all and uh, thank uh, our uh, president, Dr. Abdullah Al-Umir, who is always supportive and uh, always uh, available to support all the educational event for Saudi Pediatric Association. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, shukran Saadat Dr. Abdelaziz at Tiwim uh, for this welcoming word and the brief about uh, the Saudi Pediatric Association. And now uh, we are going to start the first lecture entitled The Role of Nurses in the Diabetic Team. Dawr at Tamrid fi al Fariq al Sihi al Sukari. The First speaker is Dr. Ashraf Abdel Qayyum Amir. He is a consultant family medicine, uh, honorary uh, assistant professor of medicine, uh, Umm Al-Qura University, Mecca al mukarrama physician executive MBA uh, from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, USA, and executive director of health services and external affairs former chief medical officer in IMC Jeddah. He is the CEO of Salam Home Healthcare Company in Jeddah. And Dr. Amir is the vice president of Saudi Society of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, he is a member of the National Committee for Primary Healthcare Development in the Saudi Health Council and a member of the Strategic Committee for the Council of Cooperative Health Insurance, uh, CCHI. Uh, Dr. Amir is a representative Saudi Society of Family and Community Medicine for the Global Family, Dr. Wonka, East for the East Mediterranean region. Dr. Ashraf Amir, uh, the mic with you to start your lecture and you have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Hafiz. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Jamian. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ajma'in. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you, and I would like to extend my thanks actually to the Prabhupada's team and uh, for the Saudi Pediatric Associations and all the organizing teams. Uh, before I start, uh, I believe, uh, and, uh, let me set up the stage by saying a, a statement here. Uh, diabetes nowadays uh, is a global health issue, and it's the concern of many international uh, organizations and international society because we, ha we are witnessing nowadays a doubling of the prevalence of diabetes in the coming few years. In 2045, we are going to have the double of what we have of patients of diabetes in 2020. And there is a big chunk of them, in fact, in the MENA region where Saudi Arabia is placed. And of course, if you just have a look on on the prevalence of was scored to be the fourth, uh, fourth rank in the, in, the, in the top 10 countries in the prevalence and the incidence of uh, type 1 diabetes. So we have 33.5 uh, out of 100,000 patients. So. Dr. Ashraf, the sound is Yes. 
الان الصوت واضح if you can manage it please yes if you okay طيب is it clear now okay is it clear yes oh yes. yes we hope to continue like this inshallah okay طيب so uh, so actually this is the prevalence of uh, of type 1 diabetes in Saudi Arabia Yeah. And unfortunately, Saudi Arabia, again, since we have on board more than 35,000 patients uh, uh, with type 1 diabetes, and this is according to the st statistics of the IDF 2070. And of course, as we know that in the previous the one decade, I believe, we have been given a lot of opportunities to use many molecules and many smart insulin molecules and oral medications in order to manage our patient with diabetes. But in spite of all this paradigm shift and the availability of this medication, still we have no change in the percentage of patients with A1C less than seven. So it means that we have totally failed to secure the well control of diabetes in our country and in, in, the, global, in the global setup. So if you just have a look here, the highly sophisticated healthcare system across the globe, like the one when USA and France, A1C is just only 50% and even maybe less more. In Saudi Arabia, it has been estimated to be 27%. And we know that, that diabetes is an, uh, it's a progressive disease and it usually targets certain organs. So it targets the, the eye. Uh, so one of the major causes of blindness, one of the major transplant, MIs, strokes and peripheral neuropathy is because of uncontrolled diabetes. And we have learned a very important lesson from the UKPDS, the landmark of diabetes trial. 1% reductions of the A1C is usually associated with a, a remarkable, promising reductions of the microvascular and macrovascular complications. But ladies and gentlemen, what we are tackling is just only the tip of the iceberg. If we talk about type one or even type two diabetes, we are only treating patients in the tertiary level and the second disease. But we are not going all the way down to the primary level of prevention, which is health promotion, early detection, and specific protection. So underneath the iceberg, we have a lot of etiology for type 1 diabetes, like the genetic factors. We have autoimmune disease. دكتور أشرف المشكلة قائمة الصوت غير واضح ومتقطع الآن. Yes, it is the problem of internet. دكتور أشرف الصوت واضح الصوت واضح الآن بواضح ولكن بيقطع برضه بيقطع يعني مع الأسف الجزء الأول كان كثير منه متقطع طيب أيوة أول بيقطع كثير طيب أوكي أي ويل جو فاست إذا الصوت واضح طيب سو وات أي واز تراين تو سي ذات وي آر جاست أونلي تاكلينج ذا فيرست ذا ذا تيب أوف ذا أيس بيرغ أوف مانجينج أور بيشنت ويز تايب 1 أند تايب 2 دايابيتيس بت ستيل أندرنيث in the, in, the, in the lower part of the iceberg, we have a lot of causes that causes the high prevalence of diabetes in our society, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and even in the Gulf region. This could be because of the autoimmune deficiency and certain pollutions and toxins, which is really available and contributing for the high prevalence of type 1 diabetes, plus the childhood obesity. So because of this, there has been a paradigm shift in the management of type 1 diabetes. And now we are witnessing a lot of modalities which has been uh, proposed by the health authorities and the decision makers globally and nationally. So now we are more engaging our patients, especially the child and the family in the management plan. And now we have converted our setup from a department or a clinic into a center of excellence where the patient is managed in total. Of course, we have been given 
the value of having a smart insulin molecules that tackle and become more convenient for the child and more convenient for the adolescents to, uh, to cope up with his daily to day activities. And there is a focus on the child quality of life because we know the child with type 1 diabetes is always having a, a socially disturbed life and he, he cannot cope up with his regular peers. The patient centric approach, this is one of the the paradigm shift that has been implemented and it has a very promising outcome and the multidisciplinary team approach. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we are working in the format of a multidisciplinary team. So it's not one man show anymore. It's a three, it's managing the patients with a multi-speciality professionals that deals with patients. So if you just have a look here, so if you have the patients in the center, we have a multiple uh, professionals, they are providing the services like the diabetic education, diabetic, uh, diabetic dietitians, the physicians, the pediatricians, the pediatrists, and even uh, the clinical pediatrists, cardiologists, ophthalmologists, and the nurses as well. So the nurse and how to formulate the successful team who can work the whole uh, and manage all the needs of the patients from different perspective, we have to have a very strong supportive leadership. So one of the team should be the leader, one of the team members should be a leader, and he has the leadership capability to organize and to coordinate the actions of these members of, uh, of the team, and then enhance an active communication. Communication is very important as well for the whole team to speak the same language that reflects for the best interest of the patient, implementations of the patient-centric approach. So Put your patient in the middle and try to look into the patient from different perspective and always put yourself in the shoes of patient, try to understand exactly what is the patient need, what is the patient suffer, and then you react based on this kind of perception. Share treatment goals among the team members. So we don't work in souls now. We, we share the information that is valuable information in order to, uh, to set up the proper management uh, tailored plan according to the patient. Now we speak uh, a new language, which is customization based on the patient profile. So one size is not fit for all. So every patient has his own profile, which is set up, and then we empower the team members and make all the resources is available. So ladies and gentlemen, um, now in my presentation, I'm going to shed a light on the role of nurses in diabetic team. So we have explored the team, which is very important team to make the success which is needed in the management of the patients on the long run throughout his life. So nurses actually, they are, uh, uh, they are a member of the diabetic care team and they are the most important member of the team. Why? They are really special. Why? Because they are accessible. Most of our kids, most of our patients in diabetes with, the, with diabetes, they are uh, encountering the nurses much more than they encounter physicians either in the, in, the, in the hospital setup or in the primary care or even in home care. She, he or she has more time. She, they, can, she, they can listen, they can have the opportunity to monitor the patient's uh, prognosis and they can educate the patients and try to use this good uh, professional patient relationship in terms of um, uh, being very close to the patient to enhance uh, the capability of uh, the management plan to be uh, successful, can place a doctor for instructions and guidance. And in fact, most of the doctors, many of the doctors, they use the nurses now to deliver certain messages and instructions to the, to the kids. And they are always good communicators. And I, I think communications comes because they are encountering and they are in touch uh, and they have the, the privilege of being with the patient for a longer time and they have the caring capability. And they always say, caring is a fem feminizing professionals. So females always try to show more sympathy, empathy, and compassion, and they deliver this kind of compassionate care in a very humanizing way. And then they, they focus on the patient profile and the patient's specific need. So this, with these all features, the, the nurses are the most uh, important member of the diabetic care team as a special member. But at the same time, as the nurses are a special in the member, as member team, we have our child with type one diabetes. He is also a very special patient. Why? Because this young man who is diagnosed to be type one diabetes, he's exposed to a lot of uh, consequences because of his clinical conditions. 
So there is a fear of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. He's very prone from time to time to be a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. His social activities has been totally dysfunction and he has, he has to be very compliant and adherent to the medications regardless of his activities. And of course, because of diabetes and other comorbidities, which is usually encountered in that particular patients, their immune system is compromised and they are more liable to have a lot of other medical conditions. The fear of injections of kids, this is one of the fears and the psychological impacts on the patients because he is becoming so stigmatized socially that he's a patient with diabetes. So he, he doesn't have uh, the social capability to, in, to mingle with his uh, peers in a, in a very appropriate way. So the social stigma is one, we don't have to label patients as a patient, as a diabetic patient. We should say patient with diabetes rather than diabetic patient. Why? Because diabetes never defined the patients. And we have to use diabetic patient just only to describe the complication of diabetes like retinopathy, nephropathy, and peripheral neuropathy rather than describing the patient himself. And the frequent hospitalization, this is one of the major issues in fact. So the nurses are available everywhere and there is many setups for the nursing to take care of patients. So we have those who are working in hospitals that are encountering the critical part of the presentation of diabetes when the patient has uh, a DKA or he has uh, a patient or he's a, in the setup of the ICU. And we have, patient, we have nurses who are working in the primary care where they are taking care of the patient on a continuous basis and they maintain the continuity of care and taking care of the preventive aspect of his health. And we have nurses who are working in the polyclinics, but again, we have certain nurses who are working in home care. And those who are working in home care, they are almost like they are working in a hospital, so they don't have any other support services, so they deliver a very comprehensive uh, services to the patient. But regardless, what, with what, uh, what is the setup, the rule is identified that the nurses should have the capability to screen and to prevent diabetes because we, have, we are now moving from disease to wellness, from illness to wellness, from intervention to prevention. So that's why prevention should be on the top priority of our uh, way of managing our patient with diabetes. So the nurses they should identify those patients at risk at the time when the patient comes for triaging they have to ask certain questions and there are certain questionnaires where they can identify those patients with at risk of having diabetes. They should engage themselves with the prevention by uh, educating the patient and his family about how to screen for diabetes, how to be on an optimal uh, A1C level to prevent the complication or even to delay the complication. The importance of dietary, dietary habits and exercise, weight control, all these importance uh, screening and preventive measures has to be taken. Moreover, one of the rules which is very important is promoting self-care. So we care for the patient, but the patient has to take the responsibility by taking care of himself or herself. So continuous blood glucose monitoring is very important and the nurse should understand that there is certain concern that might have, the patient would have and affect their ability to self-caring. So this has to be identified clearly by the by the nurse and uh, immediately an action has to be taken. Encourage the patient to use the personalized care plans. So the patient has a customized based, uh, plan based on his profile. So encouragement and empowering is another issue. So other role is to support the mental health of our patients with diabetes. And we know always underneath all the chronic disease, there is, which is an organic problem, there is a psychological problem. So usually depression, anxiety, phobias, and other things, you know, has to be tackled and to elevate this kind of anxiety from the, from the, from the patient and his families as well. The nutrition parts, some of the nurses, they have the capability to educate the patient and the family of the patients and the members of the family uh, about the, the proper dietary habits and the frequency and the calories and the carbohydrates uh, carbs, cans, and other way. And they can report if the meals are not eaten or especially, especially the carbs, or even there is, uh, if the patient is using insulins or, uh, or, or a blood glucose lowering therapies. So all these things can be reported once the, the, the nurse is attached to the patient, either in the hospital or even at home. Blood glucose monitoring, this is one of the rule of the nurses to ensure that uh, the continuous monitoring of the blood sugar, and the, the nurse should 
be able to demonstrate the full picture of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia to the patients. So the patient will have a shared understanding and will be holding the responsibility and the commitment to understand exactly his role to manage his problem. Insulin therapy, which is very crucial for our kids and for even for type, some, some of the type two diabetes. So the reinforcement of the insulin as the gold standard in, in managing of type, type one diabetes is very important to be reinforced from time to time in order to uh, have the, the mental perception of the patient that this is the actual treatment and there is no other choice. So compliance and adherence should be there. Education the patient about the hypoglycemia and to reinforce the compliance and uh, teaching the, the, the child or the families how the insulin administration can be taken. And then in certain stage of the life of the child, the, child, the family are taking the responsibility. But when the child goes uh, in, a, in a later stage after the age of 14 on, and, and more, he will start be learning how to take the, the, the insulin by himself and the responsibility will be shift from the family to the child or the, the patients and ultimately the full responsibility will be encountered on the patient. Hyperglycemia is one of the very devastating consequences which has to be paid uh, a, a huge role by the, all the members of the family and all the members of the team. So education is about the symptoms, the glucose monitorings, uh, the appropriate treatment in, the, in case of hypoglycemia, what is the actions and what are the medications to be used and to report this kind of hypoglycemic event to the treating doctors to make the appropriate management. So ladies and gentlemen, if I just want to summarize the overall role of the nurse in diabetic care, I can say screening, prevention, and detections of diabetes, it comes as a primary role of the nurses. Why? Because they are the gatekeeper of the healthcare system. They are the first encounter with patients. They are in the triage. So they, are, uh, they, are, they can keep an eye on those patients at risk, promoting self-care, and the patient individual nutritional needs can be highlighted very clearly by the nurses, blood glucose monitoring, insulin therapy, uh, identification and treatment of hyperglycemia, identification and treatment of hyperglycemia, coordinate and support with the other team. So with this kind of job descriptions of nurses, I do believe they are the most important member of the whole medical team and they are the real VIP page, uh, members of our team. So we would like to say that our, the noble mission of the nursing is to deliver a continuous, holistic, compassionate. So continuous, it means all life through. Compassionate, you put sympathy, empathy, and compassion in the, in the, in the core of your service. A compassionate care for our patients and to the family throughout the whole spectrum of life. So it doesn't end with one consultation or one visit. It's building a long-term relationship with patients so that's why we trust in, in our superhero, we trust. So our nurses, our superhero that we always trust and we wish them all the, all the best. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for your active listening and uh, I would like to leave the floor for my colleagues. Thank you very much. Shukran, Saadat Dr. Ashraf Amir. Thank you very much for this very important lecture, which, uh, tell us many things about the role of nurses in uh, taking care with the team uh, for the diabetic patient. Thank you very much. And now we are going to shift to the second lecture entitled Challenges on Diabetes Management in Saudi Arabia from the physician point of view. تحديات إدارة علاج السكري في المملكة العربية السعودية من منظور الطبيب. Uh, I am uh, honored to introduce the speaker, Dr. Abdelaziz bin Abdullah Atwim. He is working at the International Diabetes Center in Jeddah. He is a consultant pediatric endocrinologist, and he was the section head of pediatric endocrinology for many years. Currently, he is holding the associate professor of pediatrics at King Saud bin Abdul Aziz University for Health Sciences in Jeddah. And he is also an international examiner in the Royal College of Pediatric and Child Health in Jeddah and in UK. Dr. Atwim, 
is the vice president of Saudi Pediatric Association. Also, he is the chairman of Saudi Pediatric Endocrinology Group since 2008 till now. Dr. Abdelaziz Atiwem has a long experience and has been a member of many international associations, such as the Endocrine Society in USA, <clears throat> International Diabetes Federation, IDF, and the chairman of many committees at King Abdelaziz Medical City in Jeddah. Dr. Abdelaziz Atiwem's main interest is to support continuous medical education, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in the Arab countries. He was the main organizer of many national and international conferences and postgraduate courses, including Diabetes Educators course, which been running now for more than 16 years. And he graduated more than 540 certified diabetic educators for all over the Gulf and Arab countries. He has many presentations in the national and international conferences. Dr. Abdelaziz Atwim, the mic with you to start your lecture and you have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdel Hafid, for this uh, very, very uh, kind words uh, that I have. Uh, I think uh, I am uh, honored to be uh, in this uh, meeting and to present uh, something about uh, uh, burden and challenges uh, of diabetes in Saudi Arabia from a physician point of view. كما ذكرت اللي هي التحديات السكري في المملكة العربية السعودية من وجهة نظر طبيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم This is an old Jeddah and I am always go there once a month to see my childhood when I raised in Jeddah It's very beautiful downtown uh, of Jeddah. Uh, this is the other uh, part of the city of Jeddah where you can see the Corniche and the Red Sea and uh, the beautiful part of uh, uh, Jeddah and high buildings. So we can have both actually in Jeddah. Uh, Jeddah is the port and the seaboard for uh, all pilgrims and uh, for Mecca and uh, not far from Medina for those who want to visit uh, uh, my city, you are most welcome at any time. Um, the objective of this talk, because uh, Dr. Uh, Abdel Hafiz gave me only 20 minutes, I will try to go uh, quickly on uh, epidemiology and uh, uh, challenges, which is the most uh, important thing to concentrate on uh, from uh, my point. And uh, then uh, we go through the uh, economic burden also of diabetes in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and then finish by conclusion. Uh, and uh, the first slide show you that uh, diabetes is a common problem. More than 460 million uh, people uh, are affected with di diabetes all over the world and four of, uh, million of them are in Saudi Arabia. I'm sure you will see different numbers from here and there, but I can tell you that the most important uh, uh, study is the one which was done uh, uh, with Ministry of Health and uh, Professor Khaled Rubian, where the, there was more than two and a half million random uh, people being selected. And the incident is around that we have four million, mostly type two uh, diabetes, where type one only considered to be five to 10% of the uh, diabetes uh, population. Uh, and now uh, just uh, to tell you that every 10 seconds, there is two persons are affected with diabetes uh, worldwide. And this is make a lot of burden on countries and on governments to manage diabetes and its uh, complications. Uh, diabetes is a common problem. 90% of them, as I mentioned, is type 2. 
10 percent uh, are type 1, either children or uh, also adults. The uh, prevalence of type 1 diabetes is increasing, and it's increasing by 3 percent per year. That means in 10 years, we will have a 30 percent increase in type 1 uh, uh, type 1 diabetes population. Uh, and the incident in type 1, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Ashraf, is 31 to 33 uh, children per 100,000 per year. That means if you have a city like Jeddah, you ex with, with, for example, 4 million people in it, uh, say 2 million of them are children, you are expected to see uh, probably uh, 600 new cases uh, every year. The uh, uh, type 2 diabetes in children is also increasing. Uh, and this slide show you the uh, top five countries uh, with number of uh, uh, people, where uh, it, Saudi Arabia come number four. But if we take the incident, Saudi Arabia become like one of the highest country in the world, maybe uh, with the other Gulf countries. Uh, Management of uh, diabetes in children or in adults, it needs a team. You can't do it alone uh, as a doctor uh, or as an individual. You have to have a team, and the team is consist of endocrinologist or physician or family medicine doctor with experience in diabetes, diabetic educator, uh, dietitian, and also you need a podiatrist and ophthalmologist to see the, the eye and examine. Uh, you need also the patient, which is more important part of the team is the patient. So what are the challenges toward good diabetes care in children in Saudi Arabia? Uh, this slide show you the list, like adherence and compliance is a problem. Diabetes education is a challenge, financial barriers, psychological and social issues, glycemic control itself is a challenge, and also associated condition with type 1 diabetes in children is another challenge. And I'm going to go through this uh, one by one uh, to uh, probably explain what it means. But these are the challenges which we are facing as physicians. Uh, adherence and compliance Number one, children will have four injections or three injections, four injections per day. They have blood glucose monitoring. The uh, child or the family are, are afraid of hypoglycemia. My child <coughs> might, uh, might sleep and he might uh, have hypoglycemia while he or she is uh, sleeping. So I have to keep the blood sugar high so he will not go to hypoglycemia. Uh, this is how the parents think. And also there is psychosocial uh, issues. And all this uh, will make the uh, uh, diabetes control difficult and the children will have poor diabetic control. So adherence and compliance is an issue. We are not dealing with uh, uh, tablets that the child will take it. We are talking about injections and blood uh, check, checkup, uh, monitoring, uh, all these cause some challenges for the physician and for the family and the child himself or herself. Diabetes education is another challenge. How many diabetic educators we have in the country? Not enough. We have probably, probably uh, 500, 600, uh, the, there is lack of diabetic educator all over the country and also uh, in the Gulf uh, country and Arab uh, countries. Why we have this uh, limited and short number? Number one, because there is no colleges to produce diabetic educator or certified diabetic educator. What we have is courses and small effort here and there. Number two, those uh, diabetic educators, when they are 
uh, graduate from the school, from the uh, uh, course, or they become David uh, educator and they are certified, there is no job scale for them to go higher and higher. They stay as David educator and they most, uh, most of them will go to nurses or to uh, go to other uh, field so they can get promotion and they have uh, more job scale. So the number is actually getting, uh, getting uh, less and less. And uh, the other issue is uh, we need uh, uh, one diabetic educator or one certified diabetic educator for every 500 diabetic patients. So imagine how many patients you have uh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and how many you need uh, diabetic educator if you are going to take the international uh, standard. I'm, 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 I'll be happy actually if we have one diabetic educator for every 2,000 or 3,000 diabetic patients, that will be okay for us, uh, at least at this time, so we can manage our uh, patient. Uh, diabetic uh, education or education is the time consuming. The physician do not have the time to do it. They don't have the, also the scale to do it. Imagine a physician have uh, 20 or 30 or 40 patients waiting by the clinic door he or she cannot give time for, to educate this patient. If she give uh, or he give uh, 40 minutes or 50 minutes to educate each patient, that means uh, he will not do more than five or 10 patients per clinic. The, uh, so this is another issue and another challenge for us as a physician, lack of diabetic educator. Uh, this slide show you the, uh, that the diabetic treatment need uh, uh, principle uh, insulin for children with diabetes is, is important, but also also diabetic education or education education is very important. Uh, plus, of course, dietitian and emotional support and the support of the uh, physical activity. All these are important and it has to be done by a team. So now uh, uh, the other challenge we are facing, and this is from my point as a physician, is the financial barriers. Financial barrier is an issue. Many of the diabetic patients and many of type one diabetic patients lack medical insurance. Uh, if the, the insurance is not for every, uh, every uh, patient, and sometimes uh, they, if they want to go for um, uh, insulin bump or they want to go for medication, sometimes if they don't have insurance, it's a problem. Although they, we have public uh, uh, hospital and uh, uh, medical, medical uh, services available, uh, but definitely uh, it's sometimes uh, difficult for some of those diabetic patients. Uh, family income, is another issue where if uh, poor people sometimes they cannot afford uh, uh, expensive medication and expensive type of insulin. <clears throat> another uh, challenge toward diabetes care in children uh, is social issues and psychosocial uh, or psychological issues. And we know that adolescents with chronic uh, illness, they have stress and they have problems. Uh, this gives you uh, just uh, some points uh, about glycemic control uh, uh, in adolescents, where we see the uh, glycemic control deteriorate. Uh, there is several physiological and behavioral changes on those children when they enter puberty. And of course, we know that endocrine, uh, endocrine changes, including uh, uh, puberty hormones, uh, we go, go up and this interact with insulin effect and it cause uh, probably poor control of uh, uh, those uh, uh, children because the insulin requirement go up. Also, we know that uh, uh, adolescent and uh, children in, in puberty or young, uh, young uh, uh, adults, uh, they, they like to have what we call risk taking. I don't care, this is my life. 
I will, I will not take four injections, I'll take only one uh, or two. Uh, so this is another uh, issue which caused deterioration of diabetes uh, care in uh, uh, adolescents. Uh, eating problem uh, is, uh, or disorders is an issue in uh, uh, teenagers, especially in girls uh, with diabetes, and it might cause a deterioration in uh, diabetes in those adolescents. So the, uh, this uh, slide just show you what is the uh, psychological changes in children. When the child is a small and young, uh, he is uh, within the family. Anything the family say, he obey. So he obey and he is here and this is the family. Look, when the child grow up a little bit, there is a distance between the child and the family, but not that much, not uh, far. He still, the family can have effect on him and they can probably advise him and they can control him to take care of his diabetes. But look, when he become an adolescent or young adult, when he become a young adult, he stay far away from the family and he start to become independent. Who affect him here? It's not the family, it's the beer pressure, it's his friends. And this is actually an issue because the family do not have any control more on him and that might cause a problem in those adolescents. Okay, the other challenge which we have here is balancing between hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. This man is trying to balance himself. So this is what the doctors want to do for their patient, is to balance the hypoglycemia and the hyperglycemia and have the child in a good range or good uh, uh, range of blood sugar, which is sometimes not easy, but this is important and it's a challenge for everybody. Uh, what, what are the glycemic targets? The glycemic targets for patients and for uh, children is very important to know, like the smaller the child, the more uh, flexible the uh, blood sugar. We don't want it uh, between uh, uh, 80 and uh, 100, 120 in, in, other, in children who are uh, uh, below four or five years because they can have high risk of hypoglycemia and they might not recognize even the hypoglycemia sometime while the adolescent would like to see it very tight control with a good uh, range of uh, uh, blood sugar and that hemoglobin is, A1C is less than 7.5 or preferably to be seven. While here in uh, small children, we can accept anywhere between 7.5 and uh, eight. Um, so this is actually, uh, this sh slide show you the type of insulin we have everywhere now in Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, of course, you know, people are moving now from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the vials to the, um, uh, to the insulin bins, which is very easy and simple. And uh, uh, they are moving toward uh, also uh, things like insulin bump and, uh, uh, this is now becoming more and more available in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is just show you the uh, pharmacokinetic of some insulin. I will not go through them. I will uh, go to another challenge, which is important for us as a physician. And that is when, we, uh, when this child or small child become an adol uh, adolescent or he become a young adult, and he grow up, he will reach 15 or 16 years and uh, become not anymore as a child. And by the definition uh, in Saudi Arabia, children uh, is up to 15 years. Uh, and in some places we try to keep them till 18 to call them a teenager and treat them in the pediatric clinic. But what's up after that? What will happen? We have to, trans, uh, to, to uh, transfer them to adults. What is happening in many hospitals is that they just send them and dump them to the adult. 
uh, uh, this is the last uh, uh, appointment for you in, in the pediatric clinic. Uh, next uh, month, you go to the adult clinic. They are still uh, 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 children in behavior. They still need a lot of uh, supervision. And this, of course, caused a lot of problem for this adolescent. And it's a challenge toward diabetes care in children. What we should do is we should have what we call transition clinic or adolescent clinic and uh, have what we call smooth, smooth transfer of these children to the adult clinic and has to be gradual. Another challenge toward the good diabetes care in children is when, when those children develop complication of lipohyper atrophy. Diabetic educators do not teach them how to uh, change the injection site, or maybe the parents do not like to do it, the child don't like it, and this is what will happen. Then what happened? Those children develop hyperatrophy either in the abdomen or in the thigh. So the, the absorption of the insulin will be affected bad, badly and the diabetes control will be uh, affected in these uh, children. Uh, this is what we should do. This, uh, this what we should uh, teach those um, uh, children and family is how to rotate, how to rotate the injection site on the body and we keep uh, teaching them with each visit. Uh, this is uh, one other challenge which we have with uh, uh, children is what we call, uh, what we call uh, hypoglycemia and awareness. That means those children might develop uh, hypoglycemia, but they cannot recognize it. He is driving his car, for example, a teenager, 18, 19, and all of a sudden the blood sugar come down. He can't recognize it. He will make a big accident in the highway, or sometime he is sleeping in his uh, uh, his hotel uh, room in the visit, and blood sugar come down, or he is in his office or at the school. He become high bo and cannot recognize. And this is a, a big challenge for uh, us as a physician because uh, this is a, a major issue uh, if it happened. And for example, sometime it might happen while he's swimming in the sea or swimming in the swimming pool. So the hypoglycemia and awareness, it's a big challenge for many physicians and they should know how to manage it and how to uh, treat it. Um, this is just show you when, when we have hypoglycemia, what should we do for those uh, children? And as uh, mentioned yesterday with uh, Mrs. Iman, uh, she talked uh, in detail about hypoglycemia. Uh, the uh, uh, glucagon is a must to have with all the children with type 1 diabetes, uh, one injection at home and one injection at school. And nowadays, actually, we have the nasal glucagon, uh, uh, Bugs Bugsami. Uh, it's been approved by FDA uh, uh, six months ago. And uh, I'm sure it will be soon available in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, produced by Lilly Company. So this might be helpful instead of using the uh, injection or the subcutaneous injection of the glucagon, which is available now in most of the hospital. Uh, other challenges, uh, and I have two slides to finish with, is lack of diabetic educator, we talk about it, lack of food care facilities, and ask you how, how, how many times you, uh, the, you, the patient have his uh, food being uh, tested, unless he complain, uh, very little, and also uh, lack of one-stop clinics. One-stop clinics means the patient come and have seen by everybody in one visit. He see by the diabetic educator, by the dietitian, by the physician, by the uh, uh, food care uh, specialist, by the ophthalmologist, 
if needed, all in one visit. Not to make it like separate, you come next month for the uh, dietitian, next month for the uh, clinical, um, uh, for the eye exam. And all, all of these, uh, I think we should have most of our hospital or all our hospital dealing with diabetic patients to have what we call one-stop clinic. Uh, other challenge is lack of physician knowledge. And this uh, actually, uh, hopefully that this is improving with time uh, with many uh, conferences and uh, uh, symposium. Uh, diabetes is uh, also making a lot of pressure on the finance of countries. In Saudi Arabia, this is in, 19, uh, in 2016, uh, uh, 25 uh, billion, billion real uh, yearly from uh, Ministry of Health only. What's about National Guard? What's about military? What's about other facility? What's about private? It's another uh, waste of, uh, uh, of uh, money. And most of this money not go on the treatment of the patient. It goes on treatment of the complication of uh, diabetes. So we can save a lot of money if we prevent many of this uh, complication. Type 1 diabetes, it's a big challenge. Treating one child uh, with diabetes is like treating 10 or 20 adults, especially, I can remember the uh, last uh, two weeks, we have about five or six cases who are less than two years age. Less than two years, rarely we see it before. But nowadays, for many reasons, we start to see uh, type 1 diabetes in young uh, age. And this is a challenge for, uh, for the pediatrician and for the pediatric endocrinologist and for the team who are dealing with, the, with diabetes. Imagine one year, two years, or three years old child to manage him for uh, diabetes. Uh, who looks or who cares for diabetes in Saudi Arabia? Uh, uh, this is a, an, an old study, but it's showing, showing you that 80% uh, of the, uh, the, of the uh, adult population, mainly uh, adults, the diabetes population is dealt with a general practitioner. And uh, this is important, uh, only 14 or 20% uh, is looked by internists and endocrinologists. And this means uh, we should uh, get, uh, take care of our general practitioner uh, to uh, improve diabetes, not to wait till those uh, patients get worse and then they send them to endocrinologist and to hospital to be treated from complication. So we should have more budget for, uh, for family medicine and for general uh, practice specialty and for diabetes clinics, which is run by GBs. This is important uh, thing to be dealt with to improve diabetes care. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that diabetes challenges it, it's include, include the rising of prevalence and um, uh, it's increasing actually the obesity in young uh, population in Saudi Arabia. The change uh, that influenced by lifestyle of people toward urbanization uh, particularly over the last uh, three decades is crucial. And this uh, actually caused some uh, increase in the uh, diabetes population. And uh, uh, epidemiological studies that were conducted since 1980s showed a progressive rise in the prevalence of diabetes mellitus in Saudi Arabia. And economic burden and limited resources are a major challenge of uh, diabetes. And the challenges which is facing the, the uh, physicians uh, in management of diabetes include, especially in children, include adherence, lack of diabetic educators, psycho, uh, psychological issues uh, in children, and also causing other complications like hyperatrophy of the skin and the injection sites. With this, I will just uh, stop here. And they would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank the audience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
uh, and I'll interrogate him if uh, maybe uh, we want uh, Dr. Shukran uh, Saadat and Dr. Abdul Aziz Atwim for this uh, very important and informative lecture and what you said about the experience of a physician in his daily life in management of diabetes militants and a lot of challenges he is facing and how he is dealing with this and the conclusion that you mentioned is very important to be taken in consideration uh, in our uh, conclusion and recommendations by the end of this conference uh, indeed i received a lot uh, of questions we are going to answer it by the end of the conference inshallah uh, can you uh, stop your uh, presentation, Dr. Abdelaziz? Uh, I think I did. I think I did. Okay. Before I shift to the second, the third speaker. Dr. Tuim? Yes. Uh, yeah, I saw that here. Let me just try to. I will share and then uh, take maybe. And share. You need to, to stop your presentation. I'm stopping now. OK, now I stop. OK, uh, I will start uh, to by time. I am going to start introducing the third lecture entitled Updates on Management of uh, Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus Mustajidat Ilaj Marda Sukkari and Nawa Athani by uh, Dr. Reem Al Amudi. And she is consultant in endocrinology and metabolism and director of diabetes fellowship uh, program at the King. Abdul Aziz Medical City National Guard Hospital in Jeddah. She is Saudi board and Arab board certified in internal medicine in uh, 2003. Fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism from the University of British uh, Columbia on 2008. Uh, honorary assistant professor, King Faisal University Al Hassa. Uh, on uh, 2010, and she is the head of internal medicine division at the National Guard Hospital in Dammam between 2015 and 17. Dr. Rima Al Amodi is an active clinical researcher and national speaker. Dr. Al Amodi, please, the mic with you. And you can start your lecture and you have 20 minutes. Okay, Bismillah ar rahim Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And I would like to start by thanking uh, everybody uh, in the organizing committee and uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm really glad to be here and to give uh, shed some light from an adult endocrinologist uh, perspective on uh, how we manage uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, the latest guidelines. So these are my uh, disclosures. And I'm gonna have a very uh, simple uh, three-point outline. So we'll talk about the challenges in managing uh, patients with diabetes in general, and then uh, uh, some uh, a couple of slides on the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. And then we'll end up by talking about about the current um, recommended management strategies and guidelines. So I think uh, the previous uh, speakers in their marvelous uh, talks has, have already uh, set the stage and uh, talked about how the diabetes epidemic is uh, global and how the prevalence is extremely high. And what's scary is that the, we keep seeing the numbers being even higher than the projections. Like I'm sure this 463 million, uh, some stage was projected for 2030, but here we are in 2019 and it's already the number. 
And specifically in the Middle East, we have an enormous problem with an estimated 96% increase by the year 2045. Now, one of the major uh, problems of this is that it does cause premature death and it is a, a cause of death before the age of 60, uh, specifically in our region in about 60 to 80% of cases. So we know that type two diabetes out of all diabetes is the most common and it is the, uh, the main reason for this soaring rise in the overall global prevalence of, of diabetes. Dr. Arim, Dr. Arim, when the research is not working, you didn't share the screen. I did. This is uh, try, again, try again, please. Okay, so I've been talking all this بدون أي حاجة. نعم. Repeat and then try again. أنا لازلت ألاحظ شريحة قديمة موجودة. هل أنا فقط اللي بشوفها ولا هي موجودة Thank you مكتوب عليها. Um no. طيب. Okay. It's okay now. Okay. So let me just then just go a little bit back. So these are my. So this was the first slide. And then the disclosures, my three-point outline, and the talk about the, the numbers that are uh, rising. And let me take this out. Okay. So, and this is uh, what I was mentioning about the, the epidemic specifically in our region. And Mister, we cannot see your uh, slides. Well, it, I'm sharing, Doctor. I can see you are sharing screen, it, it tells me here. You want me to do a new share or what? Um, I'm not sure what. معلش نسأل الزملاء شايفينها يمكن أنا عندي مشكلة. أنا ماني شايف شيء هنا. أنا شايف أنا شايفها دكتور عبد الحكيم. So clear. I'm so clear. Continue please. I can't see it. Okay. So I can continue? Yes. Yeah, please. So as we mentioned that um, uh, the diabetes epidemic is a major cause of premature death before the age of 60, and specifically in our region, this is at a range of 60 to 80 uh, percent. And we know that uh, diabetes is the, or type 2 diabetes specifically, is the most common cause of end stage renal disease, blindness, amputations, and specifically uh, also cardiovascular disease, which is the major. Uh, cause of mortality in these patients. And we've already had uh, a whole lecture about the burden in uh, Saudi Arabia. And you could see the number for a country like the US where the cost is up to $760 billion in 2019. Everything okay? Okay. So we'll move on to the second point in the outline, which are um, the challenges in managing and I think um, uh, Dr. Ashraf before me showed a very nice uh, slide uh, on this that with all the advances that we have seen in uh, uh, types of medications for patients with type two diabetes, it doesn't have seem to affect the overall number of patients that we consider well controlled uh, with an A1C less than 7%. And one of the gaps that we have had uh, in the past or that are related to the medications that we use in management of these patients is the issues of the risk of weight gain and hypoglycemia, both of which are concerns and issues with the most effective medications um, such as insulin uh, and sulfonylurea. And it has been shown that if you use a medication in patients with type two diabetes that results in weight loss um, uh, or uh, uh, no weight gain, the, these patients are more likely to adhere uh, to their medications. And in addition, uh, it also has been found to be overall cost effective. Now, hypoglycemia per se is a major issue. And the fear of hypoglycemia has caused a lot of inertia from the doctor's perspective. In addition, from the patient's um, perspective, limiting the ability to um, uh, uh, upgrade uh, in management. And it has been a, a barrier in the past. And, it's a, and as of the recent guidelines, we also look into safety as we know that hypoglycemia is 
a major cause of mortality, especially in high-risk patients or patients with cardiovascular disease. And therefore, avoiding it is a must whenever we are designing any regimen in treating uh, those patients. Now, um, another issue that has led to major studies uh, over the last 10 years is the issue of cardiovascular disease. As we mentioned, cardiovascular disease is the major cause of death in these patients. And therefore it makes sense that you would like to use a medication that could also reduce cardiovascular events. So these are um, uh, kind of uh, the groups that we have uh, in relation to um, uh, the time that they have become available. And as you can see, for more than 60 years, we've only had in it three agents, uh, the insulin, the sulfonylureas, and the metformin. But over the last about 15 years, we have had this plethora of many uh, groups and uh, many agents that have different mechanisms. So before we go into those groups, let's just take a step back and talk about um, what are um, the principles of managing type 2 diabetes. And to know that, we have to talk about the pathogenesis so that we can understand where those anti-diabetic agents work. So in, um, you know, in quite, uh, let's put it in, 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 a, in, in a nutshell, let's say that hyperglycemia is not just uh, because of, uh, you know, a deficiency in um, insulin production by the pancreas, but there are many organs in the body that are involved and have different mechanisms that are affected in patients with type two diabetes. So uh, uh, what is the role of, of the, these uh, different organs? The most important organ is probably the adipocyte, and that's why obesity is the major cause of uh, this disease. So when there is extra, fat, uh, there will be extra production of free fatty acids that create a state of lipotoxicity. And this lipotoxicity creates um, the uh, environment of insulin resistance, requiring more insulin production and hyperinsulinemia. It affects the liver, causing increased uh, glucose production, affects the muscles, reducing glucose uptake. And it also affects the beta cells in the pancreas, reducing their function and their ability to perform. Putting these two together, you get the effect of hyperglycemia. And when you get hyperglycemia, you get glucotoxicity, which further exacerbates this process and causes um, uh, more insulin resistance. And from here came, comes the phrase, hyperglycemia begets more hyperglycemia. But although these are probably the main organs involved uh, to create this insulin resistance and hyperglycemic state, but there are the roles for other organs, as we mentioned, um, like the alpha cells in the pancreas, the absorption through the G, uh, uh, gastrointestinal system and the increasing system, uh, the kidneys uh, where you have the uh, excretion of glucose and the neurotransmitter uh, dysfunction in the brain. And since this, these are the main eight organs involved, we do um, have different medications that are available now that target these different mechanisms from um, uh, medications that increase insulin uh, production through the pancreas or improve uh, insulin sensitivity like metformin and uh, TZDs uh, with the reducing glucose production from the liver or improve, improving the muscle uptake to medications that specifically target a glucose, uh, sorry, uh, insulin sensitivity, again, TZDs, and then medications like SGLT2 inhibitors that uh, uh, act through uh, uh, excreting glucose in, through the urine. Uh, certain medications that are licensed for diabetes, but not really uh, available in all countries, like uh, a certain form of chromatrypsin. It acts through uh, the neurotransmitters. And then we have the uh, GLP-1s and the TPP-4s on the increasing system uh, and the acarbose, which reduces the carbohydrate absorption through the GI. So these are uh, the generally all the currently available uh, medications and how they act uh, for patients with type two diabetes. Now, uh, before taking a step further, we have to also uh, mention some important considerations 
in treating patients with type 2 diabetes. Number one is the fact that we know that beta cell function starts to decline before the diagnosis. And by the time type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, most patients have lost up to 40% of their beta cell function. And with time, that uh, there is going to be deterioration of glycemic control, irrespective of whatever therapy was um, used initially. So what this means is that if you have an agent that has some evidence for beta cell preservation, uh, it should be the agent of choice, especially early on in this disease. This is one. And number two, it means that patients should be educated to expect that with time, they will require the incrementation and their adding of therapy and at some stage, insulin is probably gonna be required. Now, the second point is that many people by the time they're diagnosed already have microvascular or, micro or macrovascular disease. And therefore screening is essential for these patients from the start and cardiovascular risk reduction is essential. And the Third point that again was mentioned before and I would like to emphasize is that every 1% fall in A1C is useful. So we shouldn't be discouraged um, even if patients are not below seven, but they have managed to get their A1C down from nine to eight or, from, um, or so on, or more than 1%, by itself, this 1% uh, does reduce complications and this has been showed in many studies. And then number four is that with the longer duration, the risk of complications are more difficult and, are, and the risk of hypoglycemia and the risk of cardiovascular disease becomes an issue. And this again affects your choice of medications. And we should never forget that those patients require multifactorial risk reduction in order to reduce the major cause of death, which is cardiovascular disease. So it's not only the glycemic control, but they need blood pressure control and uh, lipid lowering, and sometimes uh, aspirin if they already have had a cardiovascular event. And compared to all these other targets, uh, cholesterol or blood pressure, it, we go back to A1C or glycemic targets being the most difficult and the most challenging to achieve. So what are the current management strategies and how do we, uh, and what do guidelines recommend for managing these patients? Now, uh, again, in the first um, uh, lecture, there was, uh, you heard uh, the, the, the issue of individualization and every patient has his own profile and there's no such thing as like one regimen that can be recommended for everybody. And uh, all these you know, factors related to the patients have to be taken into consideration when designing the appropriate regimen. So these are the different um, uh, considerations, whether um, uh, the age, the, gen the, the gender, the cardiovascular disease, the hypoglycemia risk, the BMI, uh, the um, uh, availability of the medications, uh, and, and so many more factors. And this is uh, what guidelines have been saying uh, for the last probably about maybe 10 years now. I think the ADA since 2009 have started suggesting this is that the first thing you should do for any patient is you select the A1C target and selecting the A1C target could be more stringent or less stringent depending on factors in relation to different patients from uh, motivation, uh, risk of hypoglycemia, the duration of disease, the life expectancy, the presence of comorbidity, uh, complications, having support system, and accordingly, you would be less stringent or more stringent and develop the glycemic target that is appropriate for that patient. Now, overall, you could see here in blue, this is uh, the target that's less than seven, 6.5 to seven, and this target is probably the most agreeable for all uh, patients, except for the ones that you would be a little bit more loose, and those are patients who are at risk of hypoglycemia or patients who have had um, a history of cardiovascular disease or ischemic events. But you would be more stringent and even aim for less than 6.5 for patients who are newly diagnosed and have no complications because these are the patients 
that um, it would be probably more safe to achieve it, number one. And number two, if you do, they would have much more long lasting effects in prevention of complications. So that was the first uh, thing that you should do for any patient as, is selecting your A1C target. Now, after selecting your A1C target, then you can select your agent and the agent uh, selection would depend on potency. So how far are you from the A1C target that you want? And the, far, the further you are, the, the, the more higher efficacy agent you should use or the more the combinations. How much is the risk of hypoglycemia, weight gain, cardiovascular disease? How, what's the cost? Can the patient afford it? The convenience and the easiest of use. And just to summarize, um, a, a comparison of all the available agents. So this is in relation to potency or A1C reduction. And as expected, you would see the insulins being the most potent followed by uh, the GLP-1s, um, TZD, septenarias, and SGL2 inhibitors. And then when it comes to risk of hypoglycemia, again, as expected, those agents, the GLP-1s, SGL2, TZD, do not cause hypoglycemia complaint to anything that is uh, either stimulating insulin or insulin. And uh, when it comes to weight gain, again, anything that's a se insulin secreted gog or insulin by itself would be causing more weight gain compared to some of the newer, newer agents that are actually cause weight loss and others that are weight neutral. So you put these uh, into consideration um, uh, individualized to that patient profile together with the amount of A1C reduction that you want and you weigh it against each other and you come up with what um, uh, specific agent you would be uh, using. So what do the guidelines say? And here I'm just gonna um, uh, go over some of the major uh, ones, the ADA, and the ASD because they kind of have the, the consensus uh, are is the same. And just a little bit on the ACE, which is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Now, up to 2018, from 2009 to 2018, this is basically what the guidelines told us, that after healthy lifestyle, you should use um, uh, a tablet. This tablet should be metformin. And then after metformin, you could just select anything else. And it was left for uh, the physician to decide between them with no specific uh, preferences. However, as of uh, 2018, the ADA and the ESD uh, came up with this consensus that uh, put into consideration all the findings uh, from the latest cardiovascular trials um, and heart failure trials. And they gave a little bit more guidance of how you can group patients and where you should be um, uh, using which uh, agent specifically. This is the overall view of the most recent ones published in 2020. And the main features of these guidelines starting from the consensus in 2018 is that it has to be patient-centered goals. So it's um, uh, multidisciplinary, the patient being the center of, uh, of, of this uh, team and the key uh, issues that you always have to assess is the patient's lifetime, presence of comorbidity, specifically presence of uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease or heart failure, and then uh, things in relation to age, A1C, weight, motivation, and other uh, cultural and socioeconomic uh, context. And this is the major um, division when it comes to uh, presence or absence of uh, cardiovascular disease. The main update that happened in the most recent guidelines is that they put this consideration that um, you would consider these uh, medications uh, even uh, before metformin sometimes. So, um, so what are the medications recommended in presence of uh, cardiovascular disease? So if it is an atherosclerotic type of cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease. Um, uh, after metformin, they, they would recommend either a GLP-1 uh, inhibitor with a uh, proven cardiovascular benefit or an SGL-2 with a proven cardiovascular uh, benefit. That would, should be your first choice. And if 
either or uh, is used, then your second choice would be an agent that has proven uh, cardiovascular safety. Now, if it is more of a patient with heart failure, reduced heart infarction, or a patient who has uh, chronic kidney disease, then preferably it, we would start with an SGL2 uh, inhibitor uh, after metformin. And um, uh, the reason for that, as we mentioned, is cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular outcomes are very poor in patients with diabetes uh, compared to non-diabetes, and therefore using agents uh, that uh, uh, have cardiovascular protection is important. Now, uh, what's interesting is that the cardiovascular societies have also lately produced their own guidelines in which they have categorized patients with diabetes into very high risk, high risk or moderate risk, very high risk being a patient who, with diabetes who already had an established event, High risk would be a patient with a long duration of diabetes and uh, many risk factors. And moderate risk would be a, pa a younger patient or patients with less than 10 years of diabetes. According to that risk, they suggest that if you are starting the patients who are naive, they have not been yet on any sort of medication and they are in this category of high or very high risk. So patients are not necessarily needing to have an event even if they are high risk then they suggest that before metformin, you should um, uh, consider an SGL2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 uh, uh, receptor agonist as a monotherapy. Uh, while if the patients are already on metformin, then it would be your uh, second choice. And they have rated this as level uh, A evidence, as you can see here. So it's a class one, level A, uh, of using an SGL2 inhibitor in patients uh, uh, with cardiovascular risk for prevention of a cardiovascular event. And it's rated as B for reducing the risk of cardiovascular death. And the same applies to the medication GLP-1 receptor agonist. A for prevention of event and B for prevention or reducing the risk of death. So, this was, uh, uh, we, we just finished talking about patients with diabetes with uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease or heart failure or high risk for those conditions. So step two would be those who do not have any of these risks. So patients with moderate risk or lower risk or no established cardiovascular disease. Here you determine your priorities based, based on a patient profile and what is the major need of the patient. So are you aiming for weight reduction? Are you, uh, is hypoglycemia minimization the major risk? For example, in patient who is elderly or so on, or is cost an issue? So when hypoglycemia or minimizing hypoglycemia is your major concern, again, after the first line being metformin, you would consider agents that with proven um, less risk of hypoglycemia, such as uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGL2s, and TZDs. If you have chosen one of these agents and your A1C is still above target, then you can switch between them or add um, uh, one of the others uh, to whatever you have already started and so on and so forth. Now, if still the A1C is above uh, the target, then, and you need to continue adding, um, uh, then you might consider a sulfonylurea or basal insulin with a proven lower risk of hypoglycemia. If uh, for the patient, the major problem is the weight gain or promoting weight loss, then of course, after lifestyle intervention and um, uh, advice and maybe even consideration of metabolic surgery, when it comes to medications after metformin, it's either or a GLP-1 or an SGA2 inhibitor. And if you started one of them and your A1C is still above target, then you should add the other one. Uh, and after, if both are already on board and you're still not at target, then you should add an agent that is um, weight neutral, such as uh, DPP-4s. And at the end, again, if you still need to add more, then would be with caution to add uh, something like basal insulin uh, or a TZD. 
Now, of course, uh, the guidelines uh, uh, also talk about cost because a lot of these medications like GLP ones are quite uh, costly. So in areas of the world where patients cannot afford those type of medication, then we're, we're really back to our older um, uh, medications, which are the sulfonylureas and TZD. So for patients who are already on metformin, your and A1C is still above target, that would be the second choice. And if that is added than the other one and so on and so forth. Now, what about injectables? And so what's new in the guidelines in regarding to intensifying injectables? So if the patient is already um, uh, at the stage in which you have added uh, basal insulin and now you want to intensify uh, this therapy, so what's new in the guidelines is that they recommend the initiation of GLP-1 before uh, the initiation of uh, prandial insulin. And the reason for that is comes again from many studies that have showed efficacy uh, of GLP-1 uh, plus basal insulin compared to uh, aspart or prandial plus basal with the benefit of much less weight gain. And uh, after adding to your basal, your GLP-1 you, and, and you continue to titrate and you still need to add, then becomes um, the, the need to um, uh, add the, the prandial insulins. And with that, you intensify uh, the usual way. You might start with one or two with the main meals and then uh, increase it to three meals a day. So with that, I've covered the um, ASD and the ADA and the cardiovascular guidelines and just few slides on the, um, the ACE guidelines, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, just because they have, a, they add a little bit of touch more in which they focus initially on your choice should be dependent on your initial A1C. And also their A1C target is a little bit more stringent than with the ADA. So they aim for a less than 6.5 uh, compared to seven. And uh, you could see here that after uh, lifestyle, they would recommend that independent of glycemic control in patients who have established cardiovascular disease or CKD, they would recommend to go straight to SGL2 or uh, L GLP1 uh, inhibitors. So again, similar to what we saw in the cardiovascular guidelines. And then again, depending on your A1C, so in patients with less than 7.5 A1C as a start, monotherapy should be enough. And again, GLP-1, SGL-2 in patients who have established cardiovascular disease. In patients who have A1C between 7.5 and 9, they would recommend uh, from the start going to dual or triple therapy. And again, you can see in green, they focus that these two regimens should be uh, on board in those who have uh, established cardiovascular disease how, and in patients who have a hemoglobin A1C that's quite poorly controlled above nine, then uh, they would recommend insulin as a start. So these are the profiles of um, uh, different uh, diabetes uh, medications. And you could see in relation to what the patient needs um, and what you aim from the therapy, you wanna avoid high pull or weight and weight gain. Does the patient have a specific indication in relation to renal disease or hepatic disease or cardiac disease uh, and, and so on. And accordingly, you would be weighing your options. Once you start, you need to continue monitoring and upgrading uh, treatment every three months until you reach your A1C target. Every three months, you would be assessing not only the A1C target, but also looking into complications related to the medications like uh, hypoglycemias or weight gain, or fluid retention, uh, any new comorbidities that require any specific changes and psychosocial factors. So just to summarize the key points that are uh, shared by the current guidelines is uh, number one, greater focus on lifestyle. So lifestyle intervention, emphasis on weight loss and obesity management that could uh, include metabolic surgery if needed. There is more focus on patient-related issues. The patient is the center of the care and patient-initiated goals um, and patient empowerment. The choice of therapy preference is derived by the new cardiovascular outcome trials 
and uh, the consideration for clinical needs such as waste and risk of hypoglycemia and cost. And we noticed that GLP-1s are preferred to insulin as uh, your first uh, injectable. So this is my take home message. When you are designing a therapeutic uh, regimen for uh, patients with type two diabetes, what's Im most important to establish is what is important to your patients. Is there any specific indication for a, um, a specific drug or a specific group, for example, with DPP-4s, they are uh, safe, um, uh, very well tolerated, recommended in elderly. They can be used in any stage of renal impairment. Uh, GLP-1s, whenever uh, you have issue of obesity, uh, specifically in patients also with natural DEEC, they have cardiovascular benefits, renal benefits. SGL-2, again, in patients with heart failure, with chronic kidney disease, and uh, also helps with obesity, uh, and so on and so forth. And with that, I thank you very much for your listening, and we'll be willing to take any questions later. شكرا بارك الله فيك سعادة الدكتورة ريم العمودي على هذه المحاضرة القيمة حول المستجدات the updates in the management of type two diabetes mellitus ونذكر الإخوة المشاركين معنا بأن الإجابة على جميع أسئلتهم ستكون في نهاية اللقاء شكرا بارك الله فيك دكتورة نلتقي في نهاية الحلقة في البانل ديسكشن آه الآن آه أنتقل إلى المحاضرة الرابعة وهي بعنوان Biosimilar Insulin in Focus أقدم آه سعادة الدكتور آه أحمد محمود A Medical Affairs Manager Diabetes and Immunology in Eli Lilly Company Bachelor of Pharmacy Ayn Shams University 2009 and Dr. Ahmed Mahmoud is a board certified medical affairs specialist. Please, Dr. Ahmed Mahmoud, the mic with you. You can start now and you have uh, the time uh, 15 minutes for this lecture. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, but just to, before starting, you just need to check if uh, you can see the slides. Yes, it is clear. Very can, good, yes. You can continue, please. Yeah, very good. Uh, so uh, this is my presentation today. I will not take too much, uh, just maximum 10 minutes. Mainly I will share with you about uh, biosimilar insulins. Uh, what is uh, uh, biosimilar insulin and how it differs and what is the difference between biosimilar and generics and uh, uh, how is the developed how or how the development of, of uh, biosimilar insulin became now uh, much more popular uh, than before. So before we start, this is uh, this is uh, the how Lily committed uh, towards insulin therapy since started 1978. the human insulin through recombinant DNA technology and then developed the analogs or rapid acting insulins recently in 1980s. And then we have uh, the mini basal or long acting insulins. And now we have also the biosimilar insulin, uh, which has started to be present in the market. We had Kalim Mahadrat Kutaban for the slides, the Ligaya, Zail biosimilar, or what are the, the, uh, the, the, the value of the biosimilar, and what is the requirement to have a biosimilar insulin? So First of all, what is the biologics? Uh, biologic medicine or biopharmaceutical mainly uh, it, it refers to the to the large molecules. So cases of DKA in air. Yes, uh, can you hear my voice now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ahmed, very good. So the biologic medicines, they are large complex molecules mainly derived from microorganisms, either human or animal cells. They are used mainly for the prevention of uh, various disease and mainly biopharmaceuticals or biologic medicine includes vaccines, blood, blood products, somatic cells and tissues 
and uh, a lot of things that mainly used to treat infectious uh, agents like, for example, HIV. Uh, human insulin, as I mentioned earlier, that it was firstly developed by recombinant DNA technology in 1982. So if we look to the uh, different types of biologics based on their size, for example, we have uh, what's called the monoclonal antibody, which is, which is a more complex biologic. We have the insulin, which is uh, not too much complicated, like, for example, the monoclonal antibodies, which mainly are used nowadays for treating of many uh, diseases, like, for example, autoimmune disease. Mainly, they are developed through uh, having a monoclonal antibody that targets a certain for example, cytokine or targets a certain antigen that we need to block this antigen to avoid uh, a disease, for example. The insulin, as you see here, it is, uh, it's a complex biologic, not too much complicated like monoclonal. And we have the simple chemical molecule, for example, on the left side, you see the aspirin molecule, which is very simple and it can be easily manufactured and not requiring uh, a technical process of manufacturing. So what is the biosimilar? يمكن أنا هوري لحضراتكم السلايد دي تبقى واضحة فيها أكتر زي ما حضراتكم شايفين إن في فرق بين generics and biosimilar. If for example we have the patency of simple molecules like as I mentioned the aspirin for example and this patency uh, already finished after for example 20 years so uh, any company has the rights that can develop a generic product to this, as to this main molecule which is aspirin in this case and in this case, only bioavailability study will be required by the regulatory authority to have uh, the approval of this molecule. And in this case, it's called generic. But if we look to the complex molecule, like for example, insulins or monoclonal antibody, the manufacturing process is too much complicated as I will come in the coming slides. And once the patency already finalized by, for example, 20 years, so any company has a right to develop a biosimilar product, in this, in this case, it's not called a generic. So it is called a biosimilar product, which is in Arabic, it is not 100% identical to the original product because it is a complex molecule. And as I mentioned, it's manufactured, it's, it's manufactured mainly within living organism. So by any means, I cannot have 100% similarity like the original product, product like that in uh, aspirin for example. So for generics, it is a development of identical copies of small molecules derived from just a simple manufacturing process. It is easy to develop a paracetamol in the labs by a simple technique, so you can easily develop a generic. But for biosimilars, it requires a very difficult manufacturing techniques and manufacturing process, so it is called biosimilar. But there are some uh, conditions to have a biosimilar approved either by the FDA or uh, EMA in case of Europe, uh, to say that this is, will be a biosimilar for uh, the reference or the original product. What is this conditions? They should have the same efficacy like the original product. They should have the same safety and they should have the same pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of this uh, product. So this is simply in order to develop the biosimilar, the, the uh, Many studies need to be done. It is not like generic, only bioavailability study, but in biosimilar, you need to do the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic in vitro and in vivo tests. They should have the same uh, efficacy. They should have the same safety through the different head-to-head -head studies and also the same immunogenicity because this complex molecules or this complex products manufactured within living organisms. So there may be any immunogenic issues. So they should have the same immunogenicity between this product and the original one. And this is simply the, all the tests required to be applied for, the, for any product in order to mention that it is a biosimilar. First, to have the same physical chemical characteristics, the same biological characteristics, the, name non, the same non-clinical studies, and then the same phase one and the phase three studies. So in this case, once we have the biosimilar available, this is what is called interchangeability, which means that based on the WHO, the biosimilar is and is mentioned to be interchangeable. So you can change the original product with this biosimilar if they have the same, as I mentioned, efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So interchangeability means that 
uh, the physician or the pharmacist can change from one product to its biosimilar because they are the same and already approved as a biosimilar. This is the typical production process of insulin. And as you see how it is so complex, starting from the gene sequencing and then taking this gene and inserting it into a certain host or vector and then it starts to be replicated inside the host and then goes through the fermentation process and then purification and then having the final product which is insulin and as you see it is a complex manufacturing process not an easy one and this is an example of a uh, biosimilar already present in the market, which is Pesiglor, which is already a biosimilar to Lantus and Posar insulin glargin. And as you see, they have the same structures and the same efficacy and safety. So as a summary, again, biosimilars are therapeutic protein molecules with the same amino acid sequence and the same structure like a previously marketed product already present in the market. They have the same efficacy and they have the same safety. Biosimilars, again, are not, are not generics. There is a difference between biosimilar and generic, as I mentioned earlier. And biosimilar provide many options or valuable options that create a choice for prescribers and the patients to, to prescribe medication. And one of the important things that is popular for biosimilars is the cost. And it is lower cost than original product because we're already having the original product and then we have the we know the efficacy and safety of this product. So having a biosimilar manufacturing will be impacted on the cost and the cost will be less. And finally, the quality of the biosimilar manufacturing is a very important thing because uh, it is a complex technique, as I mentioned, and it needs a strict control to make sure that everything is uh, under control and everything will be okay by end of this product. Again, this is a summary of the four points that need to be met in order to have a biosimilar to the original product. They should have the same toxicology studies, the same pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics, and no difference between both of the products in the safety, efficacy, and even immunogenicity. Thank you so much, and hope uh, I did not exceed uh, the 10 minutes. And thank you again for your time and looking forward to your questions if there is any. Thank you. Uh, شكراً جزيلاً سعادة الدكتور أحمد uh, محمود على المحاضرة القصيرة ولكنها uh, في مضمونها كانت تحمل الكثير الحمد لله من المعلومات الجيدة التي نحتاجها جميعاً حول uh, موضوع uh, الإنسولين uh, أعطيتنا وقت إن شاء الله زيادة <coughs> لوقت النقاش uh, الآن uh, متابعينا وضيوفنا الكرام تلقينا مجموعة كبيرة من الأسئلة بعضها إدارية لن نتطرق إليها الآن بعضها تنظيمية لن نتطرق أيضا إليها الآن سوف يعني نركز على المادة العلمية والأسئلة العلمية بدرجة أساسية لضيق الوقت ولكي نتمكن إن شاء الله من الوفاء بأكبر قدر من الإجابة على الأسئلة التي وصلت سعادة الدكتور عبد العزيز التويم السؤال بداية لكم أفتحوا المايك لو تكرمت في الحقيقة تشرفنا في المؤتمر يوم أمس وفي هذا المؤتمر أيضا بوجود عدد كبير من الزملاء الأطباء المشاركين معنا ومن تخصصات أخرى غير المهتمين بالغدد الصماء أو المتخصصين في هذا المجال وإنما من التخصصات الأخرى ذات العلاقة بمضاعفات السكري على أجهزة الجسم ومن ذلك العيون <تصفيق> أنا سعيد جدا أن كانت معنا واليوم هي أيضا معنا سعادة البروفيسور سلوى الهزاع ولن أعرف بها فهي أكثر من أن نعرف بها علم من أعلام الطب لدينا في المملكة العربية السعودية بل في العالم لإنجازاتها ولبحوثها وأبحاثها وما قدمته للبشرية وخاصة في مجال تقنيات حديثة في علاج مشاكل الشبكية وخاصة التي تتعلق بالسكري كانت تتساءل أنها سمعت أمس في محاضرة التي قدمتها بأننا ذكرت بأن عدد المصابين بالسكري هم أربع ملايين واليوم سمعت أيضا ما بين أربعة منكم سعادة الدكتور عبد العزيز ما بين أربعة إلى سبعة ملايين قرأت في مصدر آخر أن عدد المصابين ثلاثة ملايين تتساءل 
لماذا هذا الـ 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 الاختلاف في الإحصائية لمرضى السكري في المملكة ألا يوجد مركز موحد لإصدار إصدار إحصائية واحدة نلتزم بها جميعنا في دراساتنا في أبحاثنا في تعاطينا في المجالات خاصة المجالات والمؤتمرات العالمية أتفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أولا أنا سعيد جدا أن الدكتورة سلوى الأزاع معنا على في هذا اللقاء والحقيقة أنه لن نتمكن أن نعطي عدد أو نسبة دقيقة مئة في المئة بالنسبة ل يعني انتشار مرض السكر في المملكة العربية السعودية إلا في وجود اللي هو بنسميه ديابيتس ديابيتس ريجستري تسجيل آه هذا طبعا موجود في اماكن كثيره واتوقع ان شاء الله انه قريبا حيكون في المملكه العربيه السعوديه ولكن الدراسات طبعا تختلف من وقت لاخر السكر بيزيد مع الوقت آه طبعا آه نسبه وجود 9 7 مليون آه مصاب بداء السكر في المملكه العربيه السعوديه اعتقد انه نسبه مبالغ فيها لانه اغلب الدراسات اللي عملت في السابق وطبعا انا بشير الى دراسات عملت 2007 2014 2000 يمكن 16 يعني في الحدود هذه السنوات كان اكبرها على 2.5 مليون راندوم او او راندوم كيسز This study showed that the incident is around 4 million So the 4 million diabetic patients in Saudi Arabia uh, is a more realistic number. Uh, if we take in account that we have a lot uh, or more, many actually uh, of our uh, uh, friends and brothers, uh, and, uh, the foreigners and uh, muqimin aydan huna fi al-mamlaka. لكن إذا قلنا أنه هناك أربعة مليون فهناك يقابلهم تقريبا اثنين أو ثلاثة مليون بري ديابيتيك اللي هم يعني معرضين أو للإصابة بالسكري فالعدد الحقيقة كبير وتختلف طبعا دراسات اللي هو سبعة مليون هذه يمكن صدرت عن منظمة الصحة العالمية وأعتقد أنهم أخذوا دراسات صغيرة تكون دراسات عملت يسموها هوسبيتال بيس ومعروف ان المستشفى ذا هوسبيتال بيس اونلي ذا سيك بيشنت كم تو ات اتس نوت ا كوميونيتي بيست ستدي ف 4 مليون بروبابلي مور رياليستيك نمبر بس وي شود ويت تيل وي هاف ديابيتس ريجستري اند ذن وي كان هاف ا يونيك نمبر ثانك يو شكرا لكم دكتور عبد العزيز في الحقيقه تعليقكم كان واضح جدا وإن شاء الله أزال كثير من الغموض أيضا من الزملاء الكثيرين الذين يتابعون تسمح لي عفوا دكتور عبد الحفيظ دكتور عبد الحفيظ لو تسمح لي أتفضل بمداخلة بسيطة وتسمحوا لي أنا أحب أرحب بالدكتورة سلوى ونتشرف بوجودها معنا اليوم وهذه يعني إطلالتها ووجودها معنا من أمس هذا معناها أنه هي متابعة لنا متابعة للبرامج اللي بتعقد وهذا شيء نتشرف فيه وإذا تسمحوا لي أنا حابب أنه ندعو سعادة الدكتورة سلوى أن تكون معنا في أي وقت هي تحبوا نتكلم فيه عن تأثيرات السكري على شبكية العين وهي ك يعني استشارية متخصصة معروفة في هذا الجانب فإذا كان مناسب لسعادة الدكتورة سلوى فهذا يشرفنا ويسعدنا وأعتقد أنه الدكتور عبد العزيز التويم كاستشاري الدكتورة ريم كاستشارية في السكري وفي الغدد اعتقد والدكتور اشرف كاستشاري في طب الاسره اعتقد انه ممكن نطلع بمؤتمر او ويبينار يكون مهم ونقدر من خلاله نقدم شيء للمجتمع ونفيدهم في هذا الجانب اذا يعني بعد موافقه سعادتها وموافقتكم طبعا. استاذ حسن طبعا اخوه الكرام الاستاذ حسن الباكلي هو المدير العام لمؤسسه ملتقى الخبرات المؤسسه التي تنظم هذا المؤتمر. وهذه في الحقيقة بادرة طيبة منكم تدخلكم الآن وإطلاق هذه الدعوة أنا أعتقد أنني أنا أضم صوتي إلى صوتك وأعتقد جميع الموجودين معنا لأهمية هذا الجزء في حياتنا وزيادة 
عدد المصابين بمضاعفات السكري لشبكيه العين والتي قد تصل الى العمى في في حالات معينه من الاهمال الحقيقه هي جديره بان نقيم ندوه متخصصه تكون فيها معنا الضيوف الكرام طبعا معنا وايضا معنا سعاده البروفيسور سلوى الهزاع بعد ان نتواصل معها ان شاء الله ونحدد موعدا قريبا ان شاء الله لتصريف الاضواء على اخر المستجدات والتي تعطي امالا كبيره لمرضى السكري الذين تطالهم هذه المضاعفات في يعني اكثر واثمن جزء في جسم الانسان وهو العين يمكن الانسان يعني يتجاوز بتر قدم بتر اصبع بتر اصبع لكن العين الرؤيا البصر لا نسال الله سبحانه وتعالى ان يقي جميع مرضى السكري من جميع المضاعفات وعلى راسها مضاعفات العين وان شاء الله يكون في تواصل مع البروفيسوره سلوى الهزاع تحيه كبيره لها انتقل الى او نواصل اسئلتنا الوصلت من الجمهور الكريم السؤال لكم دكتور اشرف امير في الحقيقه انا سؤال عجبني من زميلتنا الدكتوره نور الهدى في لمبان وهي زميله عزيزه وتعمل يعني بشكل كبير في عياده الاسنان وهي متخصصه في صحه اللثه وتعاني كثير من المرضى الذين يصلون اليها بمشاكل اسنان وهم ديابيتيك بسبب السكري تعتب على اننا دائما نستعرض مضاعفات معظم اعضاء الجسم ونضع الاسنان في الاخير واللثه او احيانا نتناساها كما تقول بينما يجب ان يعني يعطى هذا الجانب اهميه كبيره من وايضا ان نثقف المثقفين الصحيين ان يعطوا هذا الجانب اهميه وان يثقفوا المرضى حول هذا الجانب المهم في حياتهم السؤال لكم دكتور اشرف طيب اولا اشكرك دكتوره جزيل الشكر على هذا السؤال المهم واعتقد هذا يلقي الضوء على جزئيه مهمه اللي هي عمليه النظره الشموليه للمريض السكري والعمل التكاملي من خلال المالتي ديسيبلينري تيم اللي هو فريق عمل يشمل مجموعه من التخصصات كل تخصص يعنى بجزء معين احنا الان كطبيب اسره او كطبيب غدد صماء بيهتم بعلاج السكري بتخفيض نسبة السكر والنظر أيضا في المضاعفات اللي ممكن تصير والحفاظ على سلامة من الكاردوفاسكال مورتاليتي اند موربيديتيز مشاكل لها علاقة بأمراض القلب والشرايين لكن في نفس الوقت تبقى المضاعفات الأساسية خارج نطاق العين والكلى والقلب والقدم السكري هناك صحة صحة الأسنان وصحة الأورال هايجين وأنا يعني من هذا المنبر أوجه كل أوجه يعني رسالة إلى كل المهتمين بالعناية بمريض السكري إلى يعني اتخاذ هذه الجزئية كجزء يعني يوضع في الحسبان عند التعامل مع المريض حتى يكون الخدمة فيها نوع من أنواع التكامل صحة الفم مهمة جدا لأنه كثير من مرضى السكري عندهم تسوس عندهم مشاكل في الفم عندهم التهابات فطرية بسبب ضعف المناعة فهذه قد تكون بؤرة لانتشار التهابات البريدونتست والمشاكل اللثه ومشاكل الاسنان ومنها تنتقل الى الى اماكن اخرى فاعتقد هذه جزئيه مهمه لابد ان ترعى في علاجنا التكاملي لمريض السكري. في الحقيقه انا اشكرك دكتور امير على هذا التوجيه وهذا التوجيه عندما ياتي من قامه مثلكم انتم وايضا المتحدثين معنا في هذا المؤتمر الذي نقدمه في هذه الأمسية حقيقة له صدى كبير وله أهمية لدى مرضى نفسيا لدى مرضى السكري وعلميا براكتيكالي وعمليا لدى الذين يتعاملون ويقدمون الخدمة الصحية لمرضى السكري شكرا لكم أنتقل للسؤال التالي أتفضل دكتور عبد العزيز تعليق تعليق طريف على هذا السؤال الحقيقه يعني اي ريمبر ميبي 15 ييرز اجو ذير واز ملتي ملتيبل شويس كويستشن اباوت وات از ذا كومنست 
what is the commonest complication in patients who are poorly controlled diabetic? But the, most of the uh, doctors were thinking about renal uh, eye complication, Aye. but the, the, the correct answer was uh, dental problems. So it's almost common problem in poorly controlled diabetics. So thank you for uh, illustrating this uh, uh, possible complication for what I always say is that it was created for the future for the future of the future. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. And I thank Dr. Noura Al-Huda and all the patients from the future who are with us in this situation. If we have this question, it will show all the questions that are related to the future of the future and the future of the future. صحة الأسنان بالداء السكري سعادة الدكتورة ريم العمودي السؤال لك الآن أفتح المايك لو تكرمتي آه السؤال جاي من الدكتورة سعاد مسعد وهي مطلعة وحقيقة أنا عجبني السؤال لأنه الآن هنالك بلبلة في المجتمع حول عقار مهم جدا لدينا في داء السكري وفي استخدامات أخرى وهو ميتفورمين وما يعني صدر مؤخراً من تقارير عن سحبه من دول أوروبا حيث أنه أصبح ينظر له كارسينوجينيك لاحتوائه على النيتروزامين فما هو تعليقكم وهل هنالك جايد لاين جديد لاستخدام الميتفورمين حاليا وماذا وما هو تعليقك طيب السلام عليكم سؤال مرة مرة مهم حقيقة لأنه يمس الدعامة الأساسية في علاج سكر النوع الثاني اللي هو الميتفورمين أول علاج في, في أي جايد لاين وهو وعلاج دائما ننصح إنه يكون موجود وله فوائد كثيرة فوق بس ما هي بس مسألة السكر له فوائد أخرى مرة كثير آه بالنسبة للبلبلة اللي حصلت فهي في أول العام تقريبا أصدرت الـ FDA الأمريكية آه قرار سحب لبعض الباتشز حقت الميتفورمين، المشكله ليست في دواء الميتفورمين ولكن في تلوث بعض الـ 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 يعني الـ الادويه المعينه بتريد ماركس معينه بماده النيتروزامين، فهم وجدوا فيها انها فيها نسبه اعلى بحاجه من بسيطه من اللي هو المسموح بها. وطلبوا آه سحبها، هذا بدا في اول عام تقريبا في امريكا، بعدها حتى هنا السعودي اف دي اي اصدرت آه بيانات كثيره فيها آه جداول بكل المنتجات المتفرمين الموجوده في السوق وانها خاليه آه وسليمه، وبعدين رجع مره ثانيه برضه مؤخرا حصل آه سحب لبعض المنتجات اللي اللي في اوروبا، فهي في الاخر المشكله ليست في دول المتفرمين في حد ذاته، ما هي المتفرمين ولكن لتلوث بعض المنتجات لماركات معينه محدده فاللي انا انصح فيه اكيد طبعا انه ما نستغنى عن المتفورمين، المتفورمين ما زال موجود، ما زال هو اول دواء نلجا اليه في علاج سكر النوع الثاني وبالتالي اللي انصح فيه انه احنا نتاكد من المنتج بحد ذاته، يعني واذا كان ونشوف الصفحه حقت السعودي اف دي اي اذا هو مذكور في المنتجات اللي هو تم فحصها وسليمه فما عندنا اي مشكله في استخدامه. وإذا تسمحي لي أنا أضيف لأنه جميع الـ الـ العينات أو المنتجات المحظورة رفعتها لدينا السعودي اف دي اي ولن نجدها في الأسواق وأن المعول هو على الطبيب الذي يكتب العلاج وهو جميع أطباءنا ملتزمين صحيح دوما بكل ما يصل من أبديت من السعودي اف دي اي حول سحب عقارات معينة يعني باتشات معينة منها وليس كلها لأسباب محددة ولكن هذا لا يعني إلغاء الدواء بكامله وبجميع مستحضراته أو أشكاله أي أحد حيكتبها في المستقبل بس أنا بتكلم على إذا ممكن إنسان تسأل يكون عنده باتش قديمة أو شيء زي كده أو بغي يتأكد يقدر يراجع المصادر السعودية في أحسن دكتور بحبيط أنا عندي بس مداخلة بس يعني تعقيبا لكلام الدكتورة ريم أنا أثني على كلامها متفورمين يعتبر من أدوية دواء الميتفورمين يعتبر حجر اساس في علاج التايب 2 دايبيتس بالتاكيد وكل الجايد لاينز وضعته في مقدمه الخطوات الاولى المرحليه قبل الشروع باستخدام الادويه الاخرى الا اذا كان هناك بعض الدواء اللي تمنع لا ويمكن من المناسب يعني اللي انا حابب ادخل فيها في المداخله هذه انه قبل امس صار في لونش للميتفورمين 
بعد موافقه السعودي اف دي اي في استخدام الميتفورفين للبري دايبيتس احنا الان بنتحدث عن الدايبيتس كمشكله لكن في مرحله ما قبل الاصابه بداء السكري اللي هي مرحله مهمه جدا والان احنا بنتكلم بنتحول من الانترفنشن تو بريفنشن من الديزيز الى الى الويلنس وبالتالي لابد ان ننظر الى مريض السكر بمر... يعني بنظره استباقيه المريض اللي امامنا الان اللي هو بيعاني وقاعدين نعالجه سنين طويله وعنده مضاعفات لابد ان يعني نوجه انظارنا الى جميع افراد اسرته اللي بيعيشوا معاه وهم وهم يتشاركوا نفس اللايف ستايل ويتشاركوا نفس الجينوم وبالتالي هم في المستقبل راح يكونوا مرضى للسكري وبالتالي المتفرمين الان اصبح واحد من الادويه اللي هي معتمده لعلاج البي دايبيتس واعتقد اذا كان في سؤال انا يعني يمكن استعرضته كيف نقدر نخفض من نسبه الاصابه بداء السكري عندنا في المملكه لابد ان نتحدث عن المرحله البري دايبيتيك كمرحله اساسيه يمكن احتوائها ويمكن تاخيرها ويمكن حتى ايقافها على حسب الانظمه الجديده والاي دي اف والايس والاي دي اي كلهم وضعوا الانظمه لعلاج عن طريق اللايف ستايل موديفيكيشن وبعض الادويه المعتمده. شكرا لهذه الاضافه الايجابيه دكتور اشرف بارك الله فيك سعاده الدكتور احمد محمود ممكن اضيف اتفضل دكتور ممكن اضيف على موضوع الميتفورمين انا من وجهه نظر طبيب اطفال مهتم بالسكري انه العلاج الوحيد اللي نقدر نستخدمه في سن الاطفال اللي هو نقدر نستخدمه عاده في اللي هم تايب من عمر كم؟ او بري دايبيتيك واثبت يعني الميتفورمين له في السوق الان اكثر من 50 سنه يمكن ثبتت يعني انه انه الاثار الجانبيه حقته قليله، لكن اود ان اشير انه في شركتين هم اللي تقريبا ظهر انه النيتروزامين نسبته عاليه فيها، فالخلل ليس في في العلاج ولكن في الماده الحافظه التي اضيفت واسمها النيتروزامين كانت زائده، فيعني الحقيقه اللي الهيئه السعوديه للادويه هي المراقب الكبير لهذه الاشياء وسحبوها من السوق فان شاء الله ما في اي مشكله بالنسبه للميتفورمين اللي موجود في الصيدليات لدينا في المملكه. في الحقيقه انا سعيد جدا ان سلطنا الضوء على اهم علاج الان موجود في الاسواق ويعني يعطى لمعظم مرضى السكري ودواء اساسي وسب وحصلت هذه البلبله البسيطه لان الناس معذوره وخاصه الرجل العادي من أفراد الشعب معذور لا يعلم أسرار ما هو نتروز أمين وما هو كذا عليه بالخلاصة أنه أخذ زي ما يقولوا العبارة الأولى والعنوان أنه تم السحب وخلاص وحط اللائم على هذا العلاج فهذا شيء جميل جزاكم الله الخير دكتور أحمد محمود معايا دكتور أحمد تمام تمام تفضل طيب آه، السؤال لكم دكتور احمد لو تكرمت آه، في الحقيقه الانسولين آه، منذ بدا اكتشافه وحتى اليوم مر برحله طويله من انسولين حيواني الى انسولين بشري الى انسولين تناظري الى اشكال حديثه الان اصبحت موجوده في السوق نود ان نتحدث عن هذه الرحله باختصار بسيط جدا كنقاط مراحل تطور الانسولين تمام شكرا لحضرتك طبعا سؤال مهم جدا وناس كتير بيسالوا عليه مراحل تطور الانسولين عم... الانسولين عامه خصوصا مع ظهور الانسولينات الجديده اللي موجوده في الماركت حاليا بانواعها المختلفه ف اول لما ابتدت الانسولينات تبقى متواجده من قديم الزمان كانت مستخلصه او عامه كانت اكستراكتد فروم ذا بانكرياس اوف انيمالز دوت كان الانسولين الحيواني اللي كان اول ما ظهر في اعتقد 1800 في اواخر الثمانينات كان الانسولين بيستخلص من الـ من الـ من البيجز او الكاوز وابتدى يتصنع او ابتدوا يستخدموه في علاج مين اللي كان تايب 1 دايبيتيك بيشنتس اللي هم كانوا طبعا اي ريسك لل لا قدر الله لو ما فيش انسولين بيبقوا بيتوفوا او كده. بعد كده ابتدى عن طريق البايوتكنولوجي ابتدى يظهر الهيومن انسولين ابتدى يتاخد عامه او اكستراكت الجين اللي مسؤول عن التصنيع الانسولين في في جسم الانسان في البيتا سيلز اوف ذا بانكرياس وابتدى يصنع ب ب ب على اساس اللي هو الانسولين اللي هو الهيومن انسولين او الانسولين البشري ابتدى يبقى هو يصنع بصوره كبيره جدا وابتدى يبقى هو اللي موجود في الماركت وابتدى يبقى هو المتوفر من سنه 1900 
في الخمسينات تقريبا او في اوائل الستينات لغايه ما ابتدى يظهر في 1992 الانسولين او الانسولينات الجديده اللي هي الانالوجز او الانالوج انسولينز اللي ابتدى عن طريق تغيير بعض الامينو اسيدز في الـ 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 البروتين نفسه بتاع الانسولين ابتدى يؤدي الى ان احنا تغلبنا على مشاكل كانت موجوده في الانسولين البشري زي مثلا ان الانسولين البشري كان المريض بياخد الانسولين قبل الاكل ونقول له استنى نص ساعه ل 45 دقيقه وابتدي بعد كده كل بعد وجبه الفطار او الغداء والعشاء لازم بعديها بنص ساعه او ساعه تاخد سناك حاجه بسيطه على اساس بيبقى فيه لسه نسبه انسولين ما يبقاش فيه انسولين وما فيش جلوكوز في الدم فبالتالي ممكن تدخله في هايبوجليسيميا فابتدت تظهر الانسولينات الجديده اللي هي الانالوجز عامه في في اواخر التسعينات وابتدى دي تت... ما بقتش مرتبطه بالاكل بقى المريض ياخدها عادي على طول قبل الاكل بخمس دقائق 10 دقائق مش بتدخل في ريسك من هايبوجليسيميا الفتره نفسها نسبه الانسولين بتغطي هي بتغطي الوجبه بالظبط فمش محتاجه او مش بتدخل او اقل بكتير في الكومبليكيشنز اللي بتحصل بعد كده فده مراحل تطور الانسولين باختصار بدايه من الانسولين الحيواني الانسولين البشري لغايه وجود الانسولينات اللي هي الانالوجز او اللي موجوده حاليا في الماركت شكرا لكم دكتور دكتور ريم في سؤال من الدكتور هشام حسن كردي بيقول we saw cases of DKA in era of COVID-19 with poor response to the usual lines of management how to deal with it okay فأنا I'm not sure if he means DKA in patients with type 1 diabetes presenting ولا he means DKA in in general regardless of the type of diabetes but I can answer from my perspective from uh, COVID-19 is an infection so acute like any other infection it's a stressful condition and it can induce DKA in patients with type 1 diabetes and we've even seen patients with type 2 diabetes presenting with DKA uh, with, with severe COVID uh, disease. Now, the challenges that we face in managing, I don't think in Nahuma they don't respond to the usual. I think if um, if they are used, put on the usual insulin infusions and the fluid management, and we're managing the underlying condition well, they should be, uh, should, they should be fine. Like in the challenges that uh, we have faced as endocrinologists in managing these patients is the isolation in relation to COVID-19, is the ability of nurses to do the appropriate managing in patients with DKA. Patients with DKA on protocol needs at least minimum every two hours, uh, if not every one hour in initially, someone to check their blood sugars. And this has been an issue with the restrictions uh, in relation to, uh, to isolation of these patients, especially when it's mild to moderate DKA and the patient is in the ward. And if the patient is in a step down unit or in the ICU, maybe that would not be an issue. But in patients who are admitted to regular rooms, uh, it is a major issue and for sure, if you cannot monitor the glucose appropriately, you will not be giving you know, uh, freely insulin as you want to. And uh, this could affect the, the management and make the patient you know, have a prolonged duration than the usual uh, till they get out of DKA. So I think this is one of the major um, uh, factors. And another factor is the infection itself. And if the patient is having a disease that is not yet controlled, or fogo hatto ala dexamethasone or steroids and so on. So all these issues are aggravating the hyperglycemia and the condition and might cause also um, issues with the resolving of the DKA. أي إضافة أخرى من أحد الزملاء؟ طيب. إذا أنتقل السؤال. أنتقل السؤال التالي. دكتور أشرف. هذا سؤال من الدكتور إبراهيم الشاعر. بيقول. How to control? كيف لنا أن نتحكم في وباء السكري أمام الأعداد المتزايدة سنة بعد سنة؟ ما هي الخطة؟ طبعاً let me start by a statement. In spite of knowing more about the pathophysiology of diabetes, and instead of changing the guidelines that become more patient-centric type of guidelines, and we have smart molecules of different DPP4, SGLT2, uh, and GLP1s and smart molecules, still we have a high prevalence of uh, diabetes. And I think it's because of, uh, we are not tackling the problem from the root. Uh, and most of the time, uh, you know, uh, the, the major reason for the epidemic of diabetes in, in our country here is obesity, master inactivity, 
in proper dieting, and this contributes for the majority of the high prevalence of diabetes. Of course, the genetic factors is very limited, but more than 90% is related to the lifestyle that we live. And as I said earlier, and this is a special focus that we have to shed light on, is to tackle the, you know, the, the pre-diabetes. Once we treat a patient with diabetes, so we are treating only, we are looking into the tip of the iceberg, but still in the down, in the, in the down part of uh, the iceberg, still we have a lot of people in the pre-diabetic state and they share the same genome and they share the same lifestyle of that particular patient. And if we just leave them this way, they are going to be our full blown picture of diabetes. They are coming to seek our medical care sometime later. So as if there is a continuous a factory that manufacture more and more and producing more and more patient with diabetes. So we have to look into the lifestyle modification, early detections, specific protections, and uh, early detections for those patients who are coming with symptoms of diabetes. As is stated clearly by Dr. Reem, at the time of diagnosis of diabetes, 50% of the beta cells are lost and 4% of the beta loss of cells are, are lost every year. And the name of the game is insulin resistance. So the whole story started by insulin resistance because of obesity and other things. So that's why we, if you don't tackle the obesity, definitely we are going to land nowhere and we are going to have uh, a major epidemic. And as you know, in Saudi Arabia, the prevalence of obesity is a quite big and it's a crucial uh, uh, public health issues that has to be tackled. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and, uh, we have to look into the problem from three different perspectives, patient factors, so we have to elevate the awareness of the patients. When I talk about patients, I mean patient, family, and community. They have to know the knowledge and they have to know the nature of the disease. And they have to know that di diabetes is a progressive disease. It doesn't matter how much we spend time, hours, or we spend uh, efforts you know, to tackle the problem, but still there is a problem of that kind. And then we look into the other factor, which is the physicians. Unfortunately, us as a physicians, we demonstrate a high level of clinical inertia. We just treat numbers, but we don't look into the patient in total. And this is, has to be, and now we have a different concept that when we give patient medications, we are not looking for the H, uh, HbA1c, but we are looking for the safety and the protection from the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity and the renal protections. And the third level that we have to work, we have to look, work on the level of the, health, the healthcare system, the decision makers. They have to adapt our healthcare system to be more appealing for the proper encounter between the patient and the doctor, the setup of encounter, the timing that the physician gives to the patients, the multidisciplinary system, and the, the, the center of, ex of excellence that will tackle the patient. Because we have to understand the nature of our patients of diabetes. They come once and they disappear for a couple of months and they come with uh, complications. So if we capture them under the the umbrella of center of excellence. So we have all the multidisciplinary team in one stop shop services. So this is going to be very fruitful and this will work for the best interest of our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. In the fact, we have Ashraf on the time limited for this meeting, which is the third and the third. But I can allow the leaders of the leaders to raise their heads a little bit and give me five minutes أو عشر دقائق خليني أكون يعني الطلب يكون قوي شوية عشان في سؤالين حقيقة يعني مهمين جدا وهي تمس بعض المحاضرات التي ألقيت من المتحدثين بعد موافقتكم بارك الله فيكم السؤال المطروح الآن للدكتور عبد العزيز التويم دكتور عبد العزيز يومنشد يعني هذا له علاقة بمحاضرتك You mentioned in your lecture uh, about the smooth transition of diabetic children from pediatric to adult services. Can you elaborate that more, please? يعني حقيقة مرحلة مهمة جدا. أتفضل. This is a very important issue in uh, managing diabetic adolescents and teenagers. As you know. Uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, the uh, uh, adulthood age is variable. Ministry of Health consider 12 years or 13 years as uh, puberty. You know, he has to be to go to other. He can't, he can't go to pediatric. In other places, they said 15, one five. Uh, so 
uh, imagine that those children all of a sudden go from pediatric where they are followed for 10 years and all of a sudden they find themselves in uh, uh, an adult clinic sitting side by side next to a 70 or 80 years old man uh, and uh, the, uh, without any preparation and all of a sudden we just dump them to that clinic. Uh, teenagers, as we said, they, they like to take risk. They will forget their appointment. The system will give them appointment in six months. Then they come forget about it. And then they, they come after one year. And then we find that they are already have complications. So what I mean by a smooth transition, I mean, we have combined clinic or clinics in each uh, hospital where they have diabetic uh, patients. Uh, this is run by adult endocrinologists or adult diabetologists and pediatric and diabetic educator and dietitian where the, the, the patient will go to that clinic for one, two, three, or four times. And on the fourth time, the adult endocrinologist will take him or take her to his or her clinic. This is important for the psychological effect of those teenagers. And also we should listen to them because you know we should give them not only the treatment, we should give them the, uh, uh, the care and love. Love and care is very important for teenagers. If we didn't give them this, they will not uh, comply. They will wait and then come to you with complications. So I think this is a very simple clinic. It's, it's not a complicated, and this is a standard in many Western countries that they have what they call young adult clinic or adolescent clinic. I would like to add uh, one point here, if you allow me, Dr. Abdul Hafid. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Aziz, you know, for highlighting this very important, but I would like to mention that uh, it is in family medicine specialty. There is an approved subspeciality now, like geriatric medicine, palliative medicine, and adolescent medicine. So now the family physician, he's the one who's handling and carrying the patient in the transitionist period from the pediatric to the adulthood to the adult medicine. So I think with this kind of a speciality, which is very focused speciality with a special trained physicians, not only to look into the patient from the organic problem from the disease, but also from the psychological part and the social part, which is a major health change at that particular stage. So we started implementing this kind of uh, adolescent medicine which is run by family physicians in help to help the other specialists like pediatrics and internal medicine to handle this transition. طيب في الحقيقه ما ادري انا دكتور عبد الحفيظ كرما كرما منكم في اسئله كثيره بتيجي من الاخوان المشاركين بخصوص موضوع الشهادات والحضور ونسبه الحضور. يا ريت نوضحها يا ريت يا ريت حنوضحها لهم انه في شهادات حضور حتوصل على الايميلات ان شاء الله باذن الله ولكن بعد ما تعتمد من قبل الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال ومن سعادة رئيس المؤتمر الدكتور عبد العزيز التويم والأستاذة إيمان وقبلهم طبعا سعادة رئيس الجمعية الدكتور عبد الله العمير الشهادات حيتم إرسالها على الإيميلات بالكامل كحضور ولكن بالنسبة للساعات لكل من حضر الساعات أو محاضرات أو جميع محاضرات المؤتمر حيمنح كامل الساعات أو بحد أدنى 70% من نسبة الحضور مع ذلك فلن يتم منح الساعات وهذا بناء على نظام الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال والهيئة السعودية للتخصصات الصحية فقط للتنويه حبينا أن نبلغ الأخوان اللي معنا موجودين عشان يكون هذا الشيء معلوم احنا كتبنا على اللاشات وهذا للتوضيح يعني وإذا كان دكتور عبد العزيز يحب يوضح شيء فأتمنى في هذا الجانب حبيت أذكر أنه الغرض من هذه الويبينار هي الفائدة So it's important for people to, to benefit from this meeting Registration only is not enough Registration only for the webinar is not enough to get same out They have to reach at least, as you mentioned, 70% of the time of the webinar to get same out and this is the policy of the Saudi Pediatric Association in all their 
meetings. This is not something new, this is guideline, and we already mentioned it in the beginning of the webinar uh, that you have to attend. It's not to you register. Uh, thank you. Shukran. Madri Ma'ana Lusaza Iman? Is that Ma'ana? المايك لو سمحتي في الحقيقة أنا ترددت في قبول الأسئلة حقت الهيلث إديوكيتورز لأنه هذه كانت في مؤتمر البارحة ولكنها تعددت هذه الأسئلة والآن أيضا وصلت من غير الناطقين بالعربية فالسؤال بيقول إحنا نود أن نكون ديابيتيك نيرس إديوكيتور Is there any program that we can follow in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? And is it allowed for the non-Arabic speaker? Uh, yes, of course. We have annually diabetic educator course. Uh, it's uh, from, uh, uh, organized by uh, King, uh, King Abdul Aziz Medical Hospital with the uh, uh, Saudi Pediatric Association. It's five uh, weeks. All nurses can attend this course. The one is following in Arabic and English. It's not only for Arabic speaker, also for Arabic and uh, and English uh, uh, speaker. Uh, and uh, this uh, program, uh, after finish this program, you can working as a certified David educator in your in your hospital. Yes, and we have in the National Guard Hospital, King Abdulaziz University Hospital in Jeddah, uh, King Khalid uh, Hospital in Riyadh, and Al Hada Hospital. We have different uh, region. They do the diabetic educator course, and you will be certified as a diabetic educator course, even if you Arabic speaker or none, because all curriculum with English should be fluent in English and Arabic. جزاك الله الف خير شكرا لتواجدك معنا واجابتك على هذا السؤال في الحقيقه سؤال لمستقبل بناتنا ول احنا بندعو الى زياده عدد الهيلث ادوكيتورز ان جنرال وان بارتيكولار فور ديابيتس مانجمنت فهذا كان يعني في مكانه جزاك الله الف خير اعود اليكم دكتور اشرف وايضا سؤال له علاقه ريليتد تو يور ليكتشر اللي هو كان عن رول اوف نيرسز in the uh, diabetes management, uh, how can we empower the role of nurses in diabetes management practically? Okay, uh, this comes, you know, once you build uh, the change team, uh, the team which is a multidisciplinary, there is a physician, there is educator, there is a, a psychosocial and psychologist and others. The core, the, one of the most important member is the nurse. Uh, you know, I think nurses should be empowered and they should, give, uh, they should be given the privilege to interact with us and to have their own input. Because as I said in the, in the presentation, they are, they are having the privilege to have more time spending with patients and they are a first encounter with patients and they can have their own uh, accuracy in identifying things that is getting deranged from the norm. So they can uh, facilitate the easy access for this kind of information to the other members of the team. So building the team, the, they have to be empowered, they have to be educated, they have to be a proper job descriptions with, uh, with certain accountability and responsibility and commitment. Uh, so with this kind of commitment that is delivered from, by the multidisciplinary team, definitely the team will be a very strong team that they can tackle the problem very, efficient, very, very uh, yani efficiently. شكرا شكرا دكتور في الحقيقة السؤال التالي هو الأخير حيكون في هذه الأمسية المباركة وفي مؤتمرنا وهو موجه إلى سعادة الدكتورة ريم العمودي ولكن قبل أن أطرح هذا السؤال وهو عن سكر الحمل خليني أسأل مين يقدر يجاوب أو هو لازال معك الإجابة دكتورة ريم لأنه هذا السؤال أيضا تكرر What about hydrogen peroxide is it contraindicated as antiseptic for wound care in diabetic patient? I don't know if it's the question. I mean, but I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it more than once. And I'm going to repeat it again. So I don't know. Can you say it again? Okay. Is it contraindicated? Is hydrogen peroxide contraindicated? 
as antiseptic for wound in care of diabetic patient? I don't know. I think they should ask a surgeon that question. Uh, a podiatrist. Podiatrist or, or someone in the diabetes. Yeah. Okay. خلاص إذن ما هو مجال لنا إذا نرجع لسؤال الهيموغلوبين A one C in pregnant woman دكتورة yes. ريم uh, what is the, tar the target okay. is it value on pregnant woman uh, is it a target or to use fasting blood sugar and post brandial okay so hemoglobin A one C just uh, to give a few points. Number one, the effect of pregnancy on hemoglobin A1C. By itself, pregnancy with the dilution effect, it, your A1C will go down by about 20%. And we don't really have a standard um, uh, dyes test uh, for A1C uh, during pregnancy. Having said that, it does have a vital role in patients who do have diabetes, whether type one or type two, the role of A1C comes in the preconception period that they should not get pregnant unless the A1C is controlled and less than seven, or even preferably less than 6.5 if that's possible. Because we know that all the complications, the fetal complications, the congenital anomalies are to do with poor blood sugar control during the conception phase, which is the first trimester. So the preconception uh, A1C is very important. And I always give this message to all our GPs and family doctors who deal with women with diabetes in the childbearing uh, age, that they should be on contraception if they have a poorly controlled A1C. They should not be allowed to get pregnant. Um, and it should always be advised that if your A1C is this poor, you really shouldn't get pregnant. You should be on some sort of uh, contraception and your A1C is well controlled. So this is uh, in regards to uh, A1C in patients with uh, pre-gestational diabetes. Now, if we talk about A1C during pregnancy, um, we don't have a, all, if it's a gestational diabetes in which patients are supposedly normal before they got pregnant, what we say is that we want the A1C as close to normal as possible, so which means less than uh, 5.6 or less than 5.8. In patients with diabetes, we aim for an A1C less than uh, six if, if possible without the, um, uh, uh, the risk of hypoglycemia. However, having said that, again, I wanna stress that it is not standardized for pregnancy. It can be used as an overall tool, but the main uh, tool or the main uh, reflection of the blood sugar control during pregnancy is the self-monitoring. So the targets during pregnancy should depend on the self-monitoring blood sugar of achieving a target fasting of less than 95 milligrams and achieving a two hour postprandial of less than 120 milligrams. And when we say two hours, the two hours are calculated from the first bite. So from the first bite of food, two hours exactly, the sugar should strictly be kept uh, below 120 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So this is how we uh, follow and monitor uh, glycemic targets during pregnancy. شكرا لك دكتورة ريم وكما ذكرنا فأنا أقدم اعتذار شديد جدا إلى حضورنا الكرام الذين زاد عددهم عن الألف ومئتين موجودين معنا في هذا المؤتمر لن نستطيع أن نجيب على أسئلتكم الألف والمئتين ولكن كانت هذه فقط أمثلة من بعض ما وردنا منكم حول أداء السكري في ختام هذا العمل المبارك أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل إلى الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال على جهودها الكبيرة في إحياء هذه المناسبة بإقامة مؤتمرين طبيين المؤتمر السادس للمثقفين الصحيين للمرضى السكري وكان يوم أمس السبت والمؤتمر العلمي لمستجدات مرضى السكري والذي عشناه في هذه الأمسية المباركة كما أشكر رئيس الجمعية السعودية لطب الأطفال سعادة الدكتور عبد الله العمير أشكر نائب رئيس الجمعية ورئيس المؤتمر العالمي العلمي لمستجدات مرض السكري سعادة الدكتور عبد العزيز التويم أشكر رئيسة المؤتمر السادس للمثقفين الصحيين سعادة الأستاذة إيمان العقل أشكر السادة المتحدثين في المؤتمرين على جهودهم ووقتهم الذي منحوه لنا 
ولكم أشكر المؤسسة المنظمة للمؤتمرين ملتقى الخبرات لتنظيم المعارض والمؤتمرات أخص بالشكر أخي الكريم سعادة الأستاذ حسن البهكلي المدير العام للمؤسسة وجميع أعضاء فريق العمل معه أشكر الشركة الداعمة لهذين المؤتمرين شركة للي للأدوية أشكر الراعي الإعلامي إذاعة ألف ألف أف أم أشكر كافة القنوات التلفزيونية والإذاعية والصحافة الذين ساهموا معنا في تغطية هذا الحدث وأخيرا الشكر كل الشكر لكم أنتم حضورنا الكرام أحبتنا على تلبية دعوتنا وحضور مؤتمرنا وأنا أمل أن تكونوا قد استفدتم مما قدمه لكم السادة الكرام المتحدثين شرفتونا بوجودكم وبمتابعتكم فقرات المؤتمر وأبشركم بأن الساعات العلمية المعتمدة سوف تضاف تلقائيا إلى حساباتكم في الهيئة السعودية للتخصصات الصحية متعكم الله جميعا بالصحة والعافية والسعادة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله